Councilmember um, Hunt, Councilmember Wezar, Councilmember Reyes, and Councilmember Weiss, if you'll please make your way down as soon as possible. All right, we are now live on Channel 35. Good morning, Los Angeles, and welcome to the City Council meeting for Tuesday, July 12th, uh, sorry, 17th, 2007. We are here in the John Ferraro Memorial Council Chambers, room 340 of City Hall, where we meet every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m. We welcome our viewers on Channel 35, as well as our uh, members of the public that are here in the, the chambers. I'm Council President Eric Garcetti, joined by my colleagues Councilmember Alarcon, Councilmember Gruel, Councilmember Labange, Councilmember Perry, Councilmember Smith, and Councilmember Wesson. We have seven members and require ten to constitute two-thirds of a quorum and begin our meeting, so we are waiting three more of the following council members. Councilmember Hahn, if you will please join us, Councilmember Wezar, if you will join us, Councilmember Reyes, if you will join us, and Councilmember Weiss, if you will join us. Uh, Mr. Zine is expected after 10.30, and Councilmembers Rosendahl, Parks, and Cardenas are excused today. Um, we are rebroadcast in the evening on Channel 35, and if you're not close to a television, you can always tune in via your computer at lacity.org, where there is streaming video of our uh, meetings here in Council Chambers. We also are available through video on demand. Any of our past meetings are archived there online, and we invite you to visit lacity.org to click on those old meetings. Uh, lastly, if you're not close to a computer or a television, you can always listen in on your telephone, uh, with your telephone to Council Phone uh, Service of the City at 213-621-CITY. And you can listen to not only the Council meeting, but any of our committee meetings as well. Members of the public are invited to fill out speaker cards on any of the items which have been put on our agenda for public hearing. All items receive a public hearing either in Council Chambers or in our committees ahead of time. If it has not received a hearing in committee, uh, you can fill out a speaker card in the back and we will uh, hear your public comments here, uh, two minutes per speaker. Uh, we also have general public comment for items that are not on the agenda but nevertheless under our jurisdiction. And again, if you'd like to fill out a card and give that to one of the sergeants at arms, we'd be happy to hear your comments. And finally, if you live closer to Van Nuys City Hall, uh, we have capacity for you to testify remotely with video conferencing facilities. So please. Uh, uh, avail yourself of that capacity, and soon we'll be able to do that from uh, the harbor area as well uh, shortly. Again, thank you to Council Members Alarcon, Gruel, Labange, Perry, Smith, and Wesson. Uh, we have seven members, and we are still awaiting a quorum. This is our second quorum call for Council Members Hahn, Council Members Wezar, uh, Council Member Reyes, and Council Member Weiss. Uh, we are waiting the four of you to come down to Council Chambers as soon as possible to begin our meeting. And again, to our viewers and to our uh, audience here in chambers, thank you for your patience while we await those four council members. Thank you. Thank you, Council Members Hahn and Weiss. We are still awaiting Mr. Wezar, Mr. Reyes, and Mr. Zein is expected at 10.30. Mr. Reyes and Mr. Wezar, this is a final quorum call. If you'll please make your way down to Council Chambers. Thank you.
is our last quorum call for council members Wezar and Reyes. And uh, if we don't have a quorum in the next two minutes, we will adjourn the meeting for lack of a quorum. Uh, last quorum call for council members Wezar and Reyes. I know Mr. Zion is expected at 10.30, uh, but if we do not have a quorum at 10.15, we will adjourn. Thank you. Call the roll. Alec on Cardinus, Gruel, Hahn, Weasel, LaBonge, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, Weiss, West, and Zion, Garcetti. Ten members present on a quorum. Mr. President. First order of business, please. Approval of the minutes. Uh, Mr. Smith moves and Ms. Perry seconds. Without objection, those minutes will be approved. Next order of business. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Uh, Mr. Alec on moves and Mr. Cardinus seconds. Uh, without objection, those two will be approved. Mr. President, this is Tuesday and there is a flag salute agendized. Okay. If I can please ask everybody in council chambers to rise for our Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, Councilmember Hahn, would you be kind enough to lead us in the, the pledge this morning? Sure. I can ask everybody to please stand in council chambers. Please join with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Someday. Thank you very much, Ms. Hahn. Next order of business, Mr. Clerk. Ms. President, do you wish to take up public comment at this time? Let's run through the agenda first, and we'll return to public comment. On the regular agenda, item one is the Downtown Center Property and Business Improvement District Notice for Public Hearing. Council should open and close the hearing, and the ballot tabulation will be announced at tomorrow's meeting, and there is no action today. Okay. There is uh, no objection. We'll go ahead and close the hearing, and we'll have the ballot tabulation on the 18th. You said there is an action today or there is not? There is no action okay. required. So we will go ahead and do that without objection. Next items, please. Items 2 through 5 are street lighting district items. Notice for public hearing. Those are ordinances. Do you wish to wait uh, to get yes, 12 members? Yes, let's wait until we have 12 members, please. Hold those on the desk. Next items. Item 6 is the public hearing on the proposed bulky item collection fee, and you do have cards on that. Okay, let's go ahead and call that special for cards from the public. Next item, please. Item 7, the applicant consents to a continuance to July 25th. If there's no objection, we will go ahead then and continue item 7 until the 25th of the month. Next items, please. Items 8 through 24, items which public hearings have been held. Items 8 through 10 are confirmations of commissioners. Do you wish to hold those on the desk? Yes, please. Let's hold the uh, commissioner hearing, uh, commissioner nominations on the desk. Next items, please. That would leave items 11 through 24. Okay. Colleagues, uh, any specials? Items 11 through 24, I'd like to call 11 special. Ms. Gruel? 13 for Ms. Gruel. Mr. Smith? 24. 24 for Mr. Smith. Yes. All right. Any Could others? I, 12 yeah. for Councilmember Wiesar. 12 for Mr. Wiesar. Any other specials, colleagues? That gives us 14 through 23. Any specials? Go on once, go on twice. If not, uh, Madam Clerk, if you'll please open the roll on 14 through 23. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 on. That is approved. Yes, Ms. Hahn? What, uh, I wanted to uh, call 20 special. 20, okay. Let's go ahead and open the roll on reconsideration on 20. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 eyes. And we'll call that special for Ms. Hahn. Thank you. Okay. Next items, please. Items 25 through 30 are items which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Item 25 is a commission reappointment. Do you wish to hold that on the desk? Yes, please. Mr. And LaMange? Mr. Oh, President, on item 26, there has been a request to send that matter back to the personnel committee. 
Okay. Is there any objection, colleagues, on item 26 to send that back to personnel committee? Seeing none, so ordered. And do we have any cards, um, Mr. Clerk? I think we have uh, 29. I'll call that special for cards in the public. Mr. Labanche? Yes, I have a request we take uh, 29. Uh, it's a continuation of a report. Uh, and if you could take it out of order when it's convenient for uh, okay. the uh, ability of you as president to no make problem. that determination. No problem. Thank you. Thank you so Without much. objection, we'll do that right after the commissioners. Is Thank that you. Okay. okay. Um, any other items, special colleagues? We have 27, 28, and 30. Seeing none, let's go ahead and open the roll on the balance, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Those are approved. Next item. On the supplemental agenda, item 31 is an item for which public hearing has been held. Uh, Council can adopt both reports, but there is a recommendation to delete uh, 5B from the Plum Committee report. Okay. Is there any objection to deleting 5B from the Plum report? If not, let's go ahead and I'll move both uh, reports. Please open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Next items, please. Items 32 through 35 are items which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. And there's a request to continue item 32 for one day to July 18th. Okay. If there's no objection to continuing 32 for one day, Mr. Labanche? F31 for Mr. Weezer wanted to be called special. I know it slipped right to between 30 and 32, but if you could call that special. Okay. We'll return to that in one second. Um, number 32, um, is there any objection to continuing that one day? Seeing none, okay. Mr. Smith? For Mr. Weiss. Okay, we've got cards on 33 and 34, and we'll call it also special for Mr. Weiss. 35, we'll go ahead and open and close the public hearing. Anybody wishing to call 35 special? If not, let's go ahead and open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote 11 on 35. Eyes. That is approved. If we, if we go back to 31, and please open the roll on reconsideration for Mr. Weizar. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. And let's call that special as well. Okay. Um, if we go to public comment now. We have a number of cards today for public comment. We'll start with Rochelle Coretz as our first speaker. The Rochelle Coretz here? Oh, there you are. Come on forward, Ms. Coretz. Good morning. First, I'm honored. Good morning, everybody. On June 28, the City Planning Commission approved a baseline mansionization ordinance to protect the scale and character of many single-family residential neighborhoods. This action shows that the City is aware of the impact that overbuilding can have on the visual aesthetics in any given area. By adopting this ordinance, the City Council is recognizing that the issue, scale, the issue of scale and character of neighborhood development as set forth in the community plans is to be acknowledged and respected and that proper planning involves both a quantitative component and a qualitative component. When there is a conflict between the qualitative aspect, which is the community plan values, and the quantitative aspect, which is the zoning, the community plan and its values are to prevail. So why is it that city planners cannot undertake the same analysis with regard to R2 and R3 properties, which are out of scale with the nature and character of the neighborhood? The effect is the same. The visual aesthetics are just as important in multifamily neighborhoods as they are in single-family ones. When you have a developer who chooses to construct an apartment complex with an R3-1 zone, he can build out to the limit of zoning regulations, which is 45 feet in height, because his project is by right. However, when a developer chooses to build condominiums, he forfeits this by right status because he now needs the city to exercise its discretion as to whether the airspace above the lot can be subdivided. The planning department must accept the notion that a condominium project is not by right and must now be viewed as discretionary and limit its development so that it conforms with the scale and character of the surrounding properties. It is therefore unacceptable to authorize discretionary development, which is inconsistent with the community plans. In summary, our position is that the height of condominiums is not determined by right, but rather by following the scale and character of the neighborhood. Therefore, if a new condominium is to be built in a neighborhood where no dwelling exceeds two stories, then we advocate that these projects be limited to 30 feet. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Kretz. Uh, Elliot Katz is our next speaker for general public comment, and after that will be Richard Cairns. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Elliot Katz. I'm a 45-year-old man living with AIDS, reside downtown here in our beautiful city of Los Angeles. 
I was blessed to grow up here. Mr. Katz, would you be kind enough to lift the microphone up a little bit so we can hear you a little better? Thank you. Okay. I'm a patient living with AIDS. I'm 45 years old. I know you guys care whether I live or die. You know, we're probably all on the same team here. A couple of years ago, after 20 years of being perfectly healthy with HIV, not taking any meds, I got very sick. And I went from 160 pounds to 117 pounds in a week and a half. I would have most definitely died without access to medical marijuana. I was able to gain the weight back, and now, more importantly, I can keep it on, having safe and easy access to cannabis. It's truly a matter of, of life and death for me. I'm here to let you know how terrified I am. I'm terrified of them, the DEA and the feds, who are clearly, they don't care whether I live or die. I, I'm literally here to beg you guys to please help us. There's millions of us who are affected by this issue. I now hear the feds and the DEA are going after landlords in Los Angeles of the dispensaries in Los Angeles and threatening to uh, seize their property for allowing these caregivers to operate. This is unacceptable. What I need from you guys, please delay the start of the moratorium so existing caregivers can relocate after they're forced out, support the Hinchley Thank Amendment, you, Mr. Katz. which would cut off funds to the DEA. If I can These ask you to conclude. Funds, and the, the DEA will not be able to spend them going after Thank you, Mr. Katz. I'm sorry. We, we appreciate your comments today. I just remind our speakers, we, we have the clock there to help people guide their, their comments in the two minutes. Um, and Richard Kearns is our next speaker. Hey. My name is Richard Kearns. I'm a gay man alive with AIDS in Los Angeles for more than 20 years. I'm a new media citizen journalist. I'm a medical cannabis patient and advocate. I am poet secretary of the Patient Advocacy Network. When last I spoke with you, the LAPD had turned a burglary investigation into a raid at the Karma Collective. Today, the Karma Collective is shut down. The landlord there is one of nearly 30 LA area landlords that have received for medical um, cannabis dispensing collectives who have received warning letters from the DEA telling them that federal law allows the US government to seize their real property for permitting medical cannabis to be sold there. The DEA confirmed they have sent the letters and claimed 100 were sent. Why, you ask? Drug czar John Walters explained it at a Redlands, California press conference Thursday. It's because we're violent criminal terrorists. This is madness. This is silliness. I'm not a terrorist. If anything, I'm trying to prevent the federal government from overthrowing itself. Um, we need your help on this. As my colleague mentioned earlier, we need support on the Hinchley Amendment, which would um, it's a bipartisan amendment to the 2008 Sci Science State Justice Commerce Appropriations Bill that would prohibit the DEA and Drug Enforcement Administration from arresting, raiding, or prosecuting patients who are abiding by state medical marijuana laws. Um, we need your help um, in this delaying the start of the ICO so that some of these existing collectives can relocate. Um, Please assist us with this, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your uh, comments, Mr. Kearns. Uh, Matt Dowd is our next speaker, to be followed by Michael Hunt. Thank you. It's nice to be back. Lots happened. Um, but I want to address some of these problems in the city, and I think the best way to, um, to, to get started is to have a like a multi-jurisdictional coordinating committee, which, because a lot of these problems are on the street level for the city, but the funding is, comes from another jurisdiction. So if we have some committee that 
just puts these funds together and makes them available because we need to lobby the federal government for the marijuana people. You know, we need to get the homeless veterans off the street, especially aged. I'm seeing them down in Bill Rosendahl's district. You know, these guys are probably nearly 70 and they're sleeping out on the street and they're, they're veterans. And, they're, you know, the age, we need to get them into a place, get some buildings and make some space for them. I don't think it has to be great. And we need to get the funding from the federal government, from the VA and some of these other jurisdictions. So I think once it's the police, we've got the police we need. And we need the county support. And as long as everyone's all, you know, fighting each other, none of these things are going to get addressed properly. So that would be something I'd be calling for. It's the MJCC, the Multi-Jurisdictional Coordination Committee. Let's get that one up and rolling. Um, let me just talk about Venice Beach for a minute. The lottery down there, it's, it's, it's so corrupt. Um, the, and the problem is there's no way to enforce the, all, all the, the activity there. The, 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 it's just humanly impossible. So it really needs to go back to some kind of first come, first served system because it's just corrupt the way this buying and trading all these spaces are meant to be free speech down there. But I want to help with that, but you've got to talk to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dowd. Uh, Michael Hunt is our next speaker. After that will be Candido Maris. Good morning. Thank you for being back on the record. My name is Michael Hunt, and my first order of business today is to, uh, my heart goes out to the Gruel family. Her mother just passed last week, so I do recognize that. Second of all, um, the city attorney's office has got you guys in more trouble than it, that you guys have ever been in before. We have six different attorneys down there um, charging the city of Los Angeles $550 an hour to resolve nothing. The federal court in Fragerson said what he wanted down there. They are coming up with everybody else's ordinances but the city of Los Angeles the guy that's running the show, he's like Jim Crow. He's a racist. He has no family values. He's one of the worst guys that you can have trying to do anything in the city. And he's working on it, the city's third lawsuit. You, 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 you don't leave one to get into another one to get into another one. Recognize what I'm saying to you guys is this guy is a Jim Crow type of guy who's trying to negotiate for you guys, and he's saying that you guys are racist as well, and that you guys don't understand what Pragerson is saying in his copied order and certified copy to you guys. So watch out for that. Um, when you do anything three times, you know that it's a failure, and what you can best do is nothing, like Pragerson said. And you guys got to be aware of that. Listen to what Progress is saying. Get rid of the city attorney's office. Uh, let's settle out and save the city some money. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Uh, Candido Morris is our next speaker. Uh, Arnold Sachs will follow him. Good morning, Mr. President, council members. I too would like to express our condolences to Ms. Gruel. At the July 6th meeting, your friends, the Knights of Columbus, were there. We did not know that your mother had passed away, and so many of them knew her. Uh, they had worked with her and really adored her. So again, uh, God bless you. We'd also like to extend our uh, uh, good wishes to Mr. Ron Deaton. He was a, a great man. I knew him here for many years, and I wish him great health. I know that most of you know that I've had some battles with him, but I've always respected him. I've always felt that he's a great person and an honorable person, and he had a tough job to do. But we also have to um, really con take uh, into consideration who's going to take over to the Department of Water and Power. It's a very important position, and I am here to say that I hope that this council and the mayor will really consider Mr. David Nahai. He is a man of integrity, and that's what we need, someone that can look into the future and uh, plan for the needs of uh, the uh, Department of Water and Power and of the ratepayers. Um, lastly, I, uh, there, was so many, there was so much discussion about your retreat last week. Uh, people don't realize that retreat, uh, uh, Mr. President, was a, a valid thing that you guys did. 
from that retreat, if, if you come out of there and you're able to work with the mayor, the budget started July 2nd, the new budget for this coming year. If you're involved with that bu budget process, we can take care of a lot of the problems we have. We're losing money from the federal government. We need the input of the council and the, member, uh, and the uh, mayor to work out those issues. So if we just get that done, that money will be well served. So again, I hope uh, the people can realize we'll have a lot of benefit from that retreat. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. Morris. Uh, Arnold Sachs is our next speaker, and then we'll go out to Van Nuys. And uh, Brett Stone will be our first speaker in Van Nuys. Good morning, council members. Thank you very much. Again, back to the MTA. Um, I bring notice or like to point out to you a picture taken from the LA Times uh, from your retreat. And not necessarily focus on the person in the picture, but the writing that shows in red an agenda item budget. And again, I talk about the MTA budget and their call for uh, fare increases because they are running a deficit of over $100 million a year. Yet, they have construction authorities that no one knows what the budget is for, no one knows why the construction authorities are necessary. You have the Gold Line Foothill Construction Authority with no funding for the Gold Line construct for the construction of the Gold Line Foothill rail line. You have the Expo Construction Authority. You have the Pasadena Gold Line Construction Authority. You have a call for the Green Line Construction Authority. You yourself, Mr. President, said that the construction authorities are multi-jurisdictional. Yet you have no construction authority for the Gold Line East Side Extension, which runs through the city of LA. Why then a call for the Green Line Construction Authority, which will take place with the construction will take place within the city of LA totally. The budget for the Expo Construction Authority, over $2.5 million a month, comes to $30 million a year. The budget for the um, Pasadena Gold Line Construction Authority, unknown. The budget for the Foothill Construction Authority, unknown. If you take $1 million a month for each one of those construction authorities, that's, 50, that's $24 million a year. Added that to the Expo Construction Authority, that comes to over $54 million a year. If you have a budget crisis, you'd like to know where you can save money. I'd like to get an answer, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. Uh, we'll now go out to Van Nuys with our uh, video conferencing uh, capability, and Brett Stone will be the first speaker, and then Donna Perriman. Good morning, Mr. Stone. Good morning, City Council. Let me adjust the microphone here. Um, I'm a resident of Los Angeles. I'm a registered voter, and I'm a medical marijuana patient. I want to thank the City Council for being progressive in its stance in the fact that it's tried to address the issue of the marijuana dispensaries here in Los Angeles. I know you're working on a moratorium, but at this time, as a medical marijuana patient, I ask the City Council to put off any action on a moratorium until we can sort out what's currently happening with the federal government's war on dispensaries here in Southern California. As others have mentioned, letters were sent to the landlords of dispensaries. Approximately 20 of them are not open this morning that were open on Friday. And a lot of these were my friends. And they provided could, me with the medicine we, uh, that allows me to function. We'll hold you there just one second, and we'll hold your time. Don't worry. Um, we do have a, a rule um, against signs used. Um, we respect very much people's free speech rights to be able to put those up. And, and there's one as well that borders on um, uh, one of the words which crosses over into the obscenity area. So if I could ask folks to please put their signs down. It's a, a rule that we do for blocking people's sight lines as well as other things. Um, but if it holds here in council chambers, we very respectfully ask you. Um, they've been on TV for a moment, but um, we need to be able to enforce that. And we, we don't have uh, a sergeant at arms there to usually let people know that. But if you could do that and continue your speech, thank you. Oh, OK. Um, I just think you need to put off any action, and I don't know what the City Council can do right now as far as stopping what the federal government is doing. I watched the coverage of the DEA's press conference from Bakersfield yesterday when they raided a dispensary there. 
And the agent that held the press conference was not the Kern County DEA agent, but instead was the Los Angeles field office head. And what he said is that the raid in Bakersfield yesterday would serve as a warning to dispensaries that they should close or face further action by the DEA. Now, the city has supported dispensaries. And now it's time for you to step up and to step in between the patients and the dispensaries and the federal government. By golly, we pay our taxes to you. You're our city leaders. You care what happens to us. The federal government, the DEA, says they don't care about state law. They say that state laws about medical marijuana impede their work. Now, these laws are put in because the citizens want them. The clock now, doesn't seem to be working. You have about 15 more seconds. I just want to let you know. Excuse me? Sorry, the clock there, for some reason, is not working. You have about 15 more seconds in your two minutes. I just wanted to give you the, the heads up, if you could wrap things Great. up. Great. Thank, thank you. Um, you need to do your work right now, and you need to stand up for the citizens of Los Angeles that are literally on their hands and knees begging you to do your jobs and protect us and protect our right to access to the medicine that the state says we can have. You must protect us. You must act now because in two months or three months, it may be too late. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your comments. Our Thank next speaker you. is uh, Donna Pearman out in Van Nuys, and then after that will be Adolfo Salazar. And uh, if we can't get the clock repaired, I'll just interrupt to let you know when you're minute and 30 seconds and uh, when we're wrapping up. Oh, Go no. ahead, Ms. Pearman. Good morning. next Donna Pearman? Yes, that's correct, Donna. Okay. Okay. Condolences to the Gruel family. First, I want to commend the professional and courteous behavior of the people answering the phones on Spring Street and the courteous behavior of Cardini's office in Van Nuys. And I want each councilman and lady to thank your staff for me. I was going to say my special poem about the city council, but I have too many questions regarding what went down in San Pedro. Not only was there no teleconference, my good friend no Miriam noticed it wasn't televised on Channel 35. She saw there was no agenda. The Daily News said it was retreat. Ca Councilman Garcetti, you said it was a meeting. Neither party, I mean the city council or the paper, are known to tell the complete truth. Why are you so close now it's before you went to San Pedro about what was going to happen? Instead of slithering afterwards, no offense meant to the snake, if, and planning after the paper got a hold of it. If it was a meeting, you must have something like minutes showing what was Gat said at the meeting. Show us something that could be glanced at uh, Spring Street in Van Nuys with the guard, perhaps, or tell us at 10 o'clock we learned how to fool the public, 11 o'clock how to expedite CRA projects. What were you in a meeting about? Did you stop at one point and have a big lavish luncheon and or dinner at our expense? I'm sure you got hungry learning how to fool the public. I'm sure you didn't want the public to see you stuff your face. Did you bring your husband's wives, partners, and children? Did we have to feed them too, or did they stay at home? Did you stay at a hotel or expense, lavish, I'm sure, or did you travel back and forth at our expense? Is there any truth to the Daily News article? I'm so madly, I don't want to look at you. I won't any of them. I will not say one good word about any of you. I want answers. I don't trust you. you have, Give uh, us proof. Otherwise, I'll believe it was left. fools. Oh, okay. Otherwise, I will believe it was a retreat and we fools paid for it. I bet you wish you didn't have teleconference now. I'm done. Thank you. And, and just as a point of information, our, our uh, notes from the council retreat are actually going to be available online. They're being written up professionally right now. And uh, that w was paid for with the existing budget for our off-site meetings and was open to the public. Adolfo Salazar will be our next speaker. And uh, Patrick Duff will follow that. Again, our apologies about the clock. Good morning, Mr. Salazar. Sir Adolfo Salazar, not? We'll go to Patrick Duff then. Is Patrick Duff there? Good morning, Mr. Thank Duff. you. Thank you very much, uh, President. Um, we came to you a couple, uh, uh, about a month and a half ago, um, from the Karma Collective. After the Karma Collective was uh, burglarized, and was uh, they called the police for a burglary, and uh, basically uh, a narcotics investigation um, went on. And people were arrested, and uh, since then, all the charges I, I believe have been dropped. But you know, the Councilman Rosendahl had, had called for an investigation, and, and we still have yet to see any true investigation from the city. And the problem is now that, you know, you guys are going to be acting on a moratorium um, in a certain amount of days. And just at the same time, the federal government seems to be shutting down medical marijuana dispensaries. And to me, it seems you're in co coercion with them. And that just like in, in Ukiah and in San Diego, that what they do is they cause um, all the, the, the dispensaries to shut down. And then the city passes some type of moratorium against it. Um, 
But the fact is, in the state of California's Constitution, Section 3.5, it says that the, the state of California will protect the citizens from all threats, domestic and foreign, foreign and domestic, either way. Now, this is a domestic threat. The DEA, um, about two months ago, came into one of my establishments and um, just uh, arrested me, didn't charge me. They said they were arresting me, not charged me, and took about $30,000 worth of uh, medicine from patients. And yesterday and the day before, three left. or four three or four different places had to shut down because of this letter that was sent out. So basically, we're here to ask you to, to uphold the state constitution and protect your citizens. Um, it's funny because, you know, we have all these people that have showed up to, to talk today about this one issue, and this was only one day of planning. So you better understand how many voters are out there that understand uh, a little more and, and, and can see your co coercion with the, your, 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 um, your grouping with the federal government and teaming up on us. So Thank if you pass this moratorium you. while they're closing the dispensaries, then you've just broken the state co uh, constitution. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Sharon Brewer. After that will be uh, Alex Grabiner. Gr Gr Sharon Brewer is next. Thank you. Um, again, a little more warning, like two or three names would be helpful. Sharon Brewer, Encino Neighborhood Council, June 28, 2007, election challenges. Fact, as of today, Encino Neighborhood Council has, filed, has failed to physically post the results of the ENC June 28 election and that there was a five-day challenge period. These results were sent email on July 2, 2007. Fact, as of today, the ENC has failed to let the stakeholders, approximately 43,000 people, know that there has been five challenges filed against Encino's June 28 election. No posting anywhere, nothing on ENC's webpage. The stakeholders and the non-board member ca candidates have a right to know about the challenges. Once again, the insiders, the existing board members, know about the challenges. Fact, as of today, I had to send another email to Human Relations Commission asking them to confirm receipt of my five email ENC challenges and two faxes with supporting documentation. This original email was sent to HRC on July 12, 2007. I also wanted confirmation that my five challenges were received within the challenge period allowed. I don't understand why you have to email departments more than once to get them to respond to um, the emails, especially when they deal with the challenges, which are very important. You have 30 also, seconds I don't think left. That also, I don't think it's right that ENC, the ENC has been allowed to have their election when they um, approve their election procedures less than 24 hours before the election, which is a clear violation of the Neighborhood Council election procedures approved in January 25th, 2005. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alex Grabiner is next, and Eddie Lepp will be after that. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, City Council. I stood before you approximately two months ago to speak to you about the situation at the Karma Collective, one of the many medical cannabis dispensaries here in Los Angeles. Um, as you are aware, there were LAPD actions taken against this dispensary. Um, however, despite the fact that a good deal of inventory was seized, no charges were ever pressed against any of the operators. A judge ordered all of this property to be returned. However, we have recently been informed that it was actually turned over to the federal government and the DEA. Um, we, all these patients you see here before you today have come to ask you to take action to help save uh, safe access to medical cannabis here in Los Angeles. The DEA has found a new tactic to try and shut down these dispensaries by threatening basically their landlords threatening them with seizure. Um, as you all know, the moratorium is supposedly being passed sometime in the near future, but as you can see, this represents a severe obstacle to the future of safe access and of the well-being of patients here in Los Angeles. We ask that you keep this in mind, that you keep in mind, first and foremost, the well-being of these patients and that whatever actions you may take with this moratorium, you work with the patients and the caregivers and all the providers here in Los Angeles and not cooperate with the federal government 
um, and definitely do all that you can do to protect the amazing um, community that we have created here in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before Mr. Lepp uh, speaks, we just are gonna, we have 12 members, so if we can take up items two to five and number 12, and then we'll hear from Mr. Lepp um, on those items which you're awaiting uh, 12 members for uh, the ordinances. Please open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Those are approved. Uh, Mr. Lepp, I'm sorry, go ahead, and Jeffrey Epstein will follow Mr. Lepp. Hello, my name is Eddie Lepp. I was the first person arrested, tried, and acquitted in the state of California under Proposition 215. I'm also the largest single bust in the history of the DEA for providing medical marijuana. Right now I'm facing four life sentences for trying to provide medicine for patients. I would ask you to look at two issues, gentlemen. One, this is not about marijuana. This is about states' rights, patients' rights, and individual rights. You as our elected officials are bound to protect us. You know that. It's time that you did your jobs. The second issue here is that you have to look at the bigger picture. You're maligning a plant by the, the name marijuana. That's a name that was made up a few years back to make it a heinous drug, which the government has effectively done. The plant's real name is cannabis, cannabis sativa. And if you study its history, it's been used for over 25,000 years by mankind. It has been found in every royal burial site, every spiritual site, and every healing site found by every civilization since the beginning of time. The history of this plant is both a, a sacred and healing plant are so well documented, it is not even funny. How you can sit here and allow the federal government to violate our individual rights as citizens of this state after we have elected you to protect us and look out for our interest is ludicrous. You should be ashamed of yourselves and you should either stand up and be men and women enough to do the job you were elected to do or you should all resign immediately. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Epp. Jeffrey Epstein is our next speaker, followed by Peggy Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein, then Peggy Epstein. And that's in Van Nuys. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Epstein. Um, I started smoking medical marijuana roughly about five years ago. I have a bad back. I wear a morphine patch. The doctors are putting me on all these other pills, anti-inflammatories, that they're telling me it's destroying my liver and which, which I'm feeling all the problems now. So I've, been, I've stopped taking th these medications. I've been smoking medical marijuana, and it does help me. My brother also, Albert Epstein, has multiple sclerosis. He does smoke the medical marijuana. The pills he takes does not help his condition, his seizures. The medical marijuana calms him down, and it, and it keeps him relaxed. I see nothing wrong with this, with this, with this, uh, with the marijuana. It is helping everybody. And I'm going to continue to smoke it, whether the law changes or not. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Peggy Epstein is next, and then Jeff Berg. Hi. Uh, my name is Peggy Epstein. Um, I can't believe that the state is allowing the DEA to go forward with this. We voted on this. Doesn't our vote count for anything? Medical marijuana helps a lot of people. Without safe access, people are going to be back on the streets, and there's going to be a lot of crime and everything else. They need to have safe access. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Jeff Berg is our next speaker. After Jeff Berg will be Dale Wynn. Good morning. My name is Jeffrey Berg. Uh, I'm a medical cannabis patient, and I own a uh, medical cannabis dispensary in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm here because, uh, like so many of us, uh, there, there's hundreds now of uh, dispensaries in L.A. County, and people have put their life savings into opening these so patients have safe access to medical cannabis like the state allows. 
Uh, the DEA, as you well know by now, sent out 100 letters. I hear they're planning to send another 300 certified mail to landlords, and there's no landlord in his right mind is going to let you stay if they risk losing their property. So not only do all the dispensary owners risk losing all their, my life savings, which I invested in the business, uh, but patients will not be able to access medical marijuana. Now, I, I pay about, uh, I don't want to give the exact figure, but let's say uh, four to $7,000 a month in sales tax to the state every single month for the sale of medical cannabis and uh, the state is not protecting us. It's, it's plain and simple. Uh, it's taxation without representation. We're tired of it. We need you to step up for us. And secondly, uh, there is a moratorium supposed to go into effect. The moratorium states that uh, a medical cannabis dispensary cannot move. So if the feds close us down and we have a moratorium, we're not even allowed to reopen. So uh, we need your help. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker in Van Nuys is Dale Wynn. Dale Wynn, and then we'll come back here to Council Chambers for Oscar Johnson. Good morning, Mr. Wynn. Uh, good morning. I'd like to thank the City Council for listening to me. Uh, my name is Dale Wynn. I've lived and uh, worked in the San Fernando Valley all 43 of my 43 years alive. And I've uh, been in the military. I played semi-pro football. I'm not bragging about those things. I'm just saying that those are things that, that made me who I am, and uh, I never would have considered medical marijuana up until about uh, seven years ago, that is. Um, I've had both knees replaced, both hips, due to avascular necrosis, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, degenerative joint disease in general, and uh, I've been on morphine uh, for uh, quite a number of those years. Legal prescriptions. And uh, it seems to me that instead of the federal government going after dispensaries for medical marijuana that help me as a patient retain and gain safe access, but above and beyond that, allow me to want to live because I cannot eat and I cannot sleep because of the drugs that I take that are legal and prescribed to me by doctors and are legal because of lobbyists and drug companies. If you want to go after real drug dealers, it seems to me, federal government, you should go after the makers of MS Cotton and Oxycontin and Vicodin and the narcotics and the narcotics that make us have to turn to medical cannabis in the first place. I implore you, please listen to us. Back our safe access to medical cannabis. Hear our voice and stand up for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know Mr. Uh, Zein wanted to uh, say a, a word in response um, under our uh, state law because this wasn't agendized for folks who would want to be here on all sides of the issue. We have to keep that response brief, unfortunately, in the public meeting, but obviously, uh, private correspondences can continue that conversation. But Mr. Uh, Zine, briefly on this issue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the individuals in the Valley, at the Valley City Hall, regarding this matter, the uh, motion that I drafted a year and a half ago addressed this issue, uh, calling for a moratorium. A task force was uh, prepared, to tra a task force involved the planning department, LAPD, the caregivers and patients, and it was signed yesterday by Ms. Goldberg, General Manager of the Planning Department, uh, and it's in Plum, the Interim Control Ordinance should resolve a lot of these issues. It's interesting that a year and a half ago there were five identified locations by LAPD. There are currently two to 400 locations in the city of Los Angeles. So what we plan to do is hopefully get this in place and this moratorium will bring a result where hopefully the federal government will intercede as they've been doing and we empathize with those individuals that are utilizing medical marijuana, and we're trying to come to a conclusion, a satisfactory conclusion for those individuals as, and as well as the community. So just bear with us as we go through this, but we did author this uh, motion a year and a half ago, 
and we still haven't come to the final conclusion. So hopefully it'll be relatively soon. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Zine. Our final public speaker is here in Council Chambers, Oscar Johnson. I'd like to come forward. Councilman, since Council President and City Council, my name is Oscar Johnson, proactive for the homeless, of Los I'm proactive for the homeless of Los Angeles, and I see where the, our mayor and the uh, chief of police and the district attorney, they receive so many millions of dollars to help the homeless, especially the African American men that are suffering and seem as though we're on this 21st century, we are still the victim of a fallen society, and, and, and we experience the worst genocide since, we've been, since we have been free from slavery through our political system because we you know we get so much money to represent each and every one individual in society but it seems as though the money spreads around the African American community and they don't receive any money. Anyway, I think in the city of Los Angeles we have too many liquor stores in Los Angeles, you know, where the you know poor people congregate. I think, you know, all the liquor stores should be closed closed <coughs> closed down. Then we see where uh our fire department and they fire trucks, they go up, up and down the street, uh, medicine, they are uh, in danger of life of innocent people. They be staged in they uh, fire scene, put be no fire scene, put be no fire scene. And our district attorney office is really failing us greatly. They have getting mi millions of dollars to help fight crime and help solve murders. And uh, they do not spend anything near, near solving murders pertaining to African American people with African America. Seem as though uh, we're just living in a society of uh, what unfit authority, of unfit supervising, if any, and that really have failed us. And that King Drew Hospital should be closed down immediately. Because I remember when uh, King Drew was open, they had Caucasian staff and the community flourished. You know, it, it was ran properly, but they phased Caucasian America out. They brought in more minorities in the, in the hospital, started going down, 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 haven't stopped going down yet. And I think uh, that's a part of our health care. And uh, I think our Constitution, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights do not accept us to have majesty in our government. We should strive for a better, perfect government or strive for more uh, stable liability. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. That closes our general public comment for today. Thank you to all of our members of the public who were here for that. Um, if we can take up our commissioners uh, first, and then we've had two requests for items out of order 29 from Mr. LaBonge and 33 from Mr. Weiss. So without objection, we'll take the commissioners and then those. Uh, first commissioner, please. That is item eight, and that is the reappointment of Mr. Steve Juarez to the Board of Fire and Police Pension Commissioners. Okay. And um, okay, I'd like to. Uh, this came out of budget and finance. Excuse me, and, and I know Mr. Parks is uh, is away, so he's not here. Would you like to say anything to the, the council? No, we just thank, thank you, you for, for the invitation offering. to be here today. And I'm uh, Steve Juarez with the LA City Fire and Police Pension Commission. Glad to be here and glad to be of service to the city. Thank you, Mr. Juarez. Uh, thank you for your patience this morning, Mr. Labonge. Very much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your service. I believe in all our employees. I believe we pay people well. We should work hard, serve the city well, as do our police and firefighters. And I want to make sure their pensions are fully funded and made sure that it doesn't overburden the city. Can you say right now that we are projected in that right direction in the we, future we, years? We are. I'm very pleased to report to, to the City Council that uh, although the numbers aren't final for at least the 2006-07 fiscal year, we doubled uh, our projected uh, target rate for investment returns. Uh, we'll probably be up, upwards of 19 percent based in our target rates, 8 percent. So we're, good. we're currently 94.5 percent funded. We hope to eventually get back over 100 percent as we were a couple of years ago. Right. Uh, serve the uh, city well by protecting its interests and that of the employees who've served this city well. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. Sir. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. LeBonge. Uh, Mr. Zine? Oh, okay. All right. Oh, you want to recuse yourself? Okay. Mr. Zine, I just want to announce, is going to recuse himself. Um, so he will, if we step out, Mr. Zine, for this vote. You'll be recorded as, as not present for this. Um, with that, let's go ahead and open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Congratulations. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Juarez. Our next appointment, please. Item 9 is the appointment of Ms. Sharon DeLugich to the Rent Adjustment Commission. I recognize the chair of our Housing, Community, and Economic Development Committee, Mr. Wesson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, President and, and members. Today we had uh, a great honor to <laughs> to uh, have a discussion with a friend that many of us on the committee have known for years, 
an individual who's in a unique experience, uh, I mean, uh, finds herself in a unique situation given her set of experiences as a staffer to a council person, as a, an individual with the, the, the mayor's office, an individual who's a community organizer, an individual who has a track record of bringing people together and getting things done. So it was the, uh, the committee uh, voted unanimously to send this to the floor, requesting that, that we as a council uh, vote yes in this confirmation. Thank you. Mr. Labonge. Sharon DeLugich and her family, a great family of the Silver Lake Los Feliz area, saw your father walking his dogs this morning, and he's a great advocate, uh, her father, for, for seniors and, and is helpful and instrumental in the new Greater uh, Griffith Park Senior Adult Center that's there. So I thank you, Sharon, for your work. Be fair to people, be fair for the housing uh, producers, providers, and also, most importantly, the tenants who need the most help is all. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Council President. Just rise to support Mr. Lugic. I think it's a great uh, model in terms of how one person can be involved at the council level, has the pulse of the community, and has worked with the mayor's office, and now working as an advocate and is able to distinguish and understand the intricacies of what this particular commission is engaged with when it comes to the challenges of living in Los Angeles. Um, but I just want to ask you this question again. I asked you this in committee. In regards to our challenges as policymakers, we have not quite addressed the real issue of how we promote policy that gives individuals the ability to have a roof over their head. Um, in terms of a commissioner and your association with the mayor's uh, personnel and, and all the work they do in coordination with the council, how can we promote that policy and how we can move it up? And I just want to bring that to you again. Well, thank you, and thank you all. I will certainly do the best I can. I, I appreciate what Council Member Weston said of bringing people together and getting things done, because those are the two things I, I feel like I do bring uh, to this commission. And in that regard, uh, I'm very interested in, in, in researching policies that are out there and, and new ones that are yet to be thought of and bringing them to tenants and, and landlords and housing developers and housing advocates and, and working with people that I know and, and, and all the commissioners on the Rent Adjustment Commission have a lot of networks and working together to make real solutions happen in a, in a timely manner that, as you, as you say and as you know, the problems get worse every single day for tenants in Los Angeles. So I'll, I'll do my best to, to help bring some real solutions. Well, I was very careful not to bring up the word inclusionary <laughs> zoning, but I'm not speaking to that specifically, but right. something that allows us on a citywide basis to promote a healthier city by providing housing for our workforce mm -hmm. and for those who are most in need as well. So thank you for your hard work. <laughs> look forward to working with you and uh, thank you. good luck. I look forward to working with you too. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. And that finishes the speaker queue. And thank you, Mr. Lugich, mm -hmm. for offering yourself uh, for continued public service. You've, I know, served at least three council members here, a mayor and, and the entire city of Los Angeles. So congratulations on that very good work. And let's make this official. Please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Congratulations, Commissioner. All right. Our next uh, commission nomination, please. Item 10 is the appointment of Mr. Victor Viramontes to the Central Area Planning Commission. Uh, for Mr. Viramontes, I'd like to recognize Mr. Reyes, the chair of our Planning Land Use Management Committee, for Mr. Viramontes' nomination to the Central Area Planning Commission. If you'd like to come forward and have a seat. Thank you. I just want to thank Mr. Miramontes for joining us. Um, I just want to ask one question, and that is um, what role you find yourself playing and, and the quali what qualifies you to be in this commission. If you can share that with us, I appreciate it very much. I, I have a long history of serving the city of Los Angeles. I, I began as a playground supervisor for Los Angeles Unified School District as a teenager. Went on to teach sixth grade at a Catholic school within the city of Los Angeles before going to law school. I then clerked for Justice Carlos Moreno on the federal bench uh, before working at Heller Ehrman, uh, a downtown law firm. 
and then uh, serving at MALDEF for four years as a civil rights attorney and now uh, work as a civil rights attorney uh, at the EEOC for the federal government. And within those dynamics, I'm assuming that the pressures of those areas that have several thousands of people living in one square mile are the type of insights that you can bring to the table when we discuss land use policies. Yes, council, council member. I think uh, the increasing density that the city faces and the and difficult ba balances that, that we have to make serving the, inner, the immediate community and also the larger community of Los Angeles, those, those are some of the issues I wish to focus on on this commission. And given that Los Angeles is the Alice Island of the West, so many different groups live here as immigrants or first generation. Um, do you speak more than one language? Yes, I, I'm fluent in uh, both English and Spanish, and I think that's one of the things that makes uh, Los Angeles so, so, such a vibrant, wonderful community. Great, and uh, I appreciate all that you do. I believe the commission is a critical place in which we can respect the rights of the individual as property owners and as tenants. Uh, and I think being able to speak more than one language allows for level of, of comfort and confidence in participating in the process. So I, I thank you for that as well, and, and good luck to you, and I urge and I vote. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes, and I, I too would vouch for Mr. Viramontes, who's a, a friend and uh, whose accomplishments speak for themselves, as you, as you heard, um, and we really look forward to having your voice on the Central Area Planning Commission. In fact, one of the largest uh, projects in the Central Area we're going to be voting on a little bit later in the Hollywood area, so feel free to stick around, um, but we congratulate you and really appreciate your service and all the contributions you've made uh, already to Los Angeles. So let's go ahead and open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Congratulations. Good work. Next uh, item, please. Item 25 is the reappointment of Mr. Diego de la Garza to the Police Permit Review Panel. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, would you like to share anything about your uh, desire to serve with the uh, council? I'd just like to say uh, thank you for the invitation for being here, and I've been serving for a year and a half. It's been a pleasure, and I hope to continue that service. Great. Well, we look forward to that. Anybody wishing to be heard on this nomination? If not, let's go. Oh, Mr. Zine. So quick on that button, Mr. Garcetti. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, your commission serves a vital role when it comes to quality of life in neighborhoods, and there are many clubs that are currently in Hollywood, spreading throughout the downtown other areas, and it's critical that the commission, when they review those applications, put the proper conditions. Can you go into some detail from what you have seen with the number of clubs that have opened and conditions imposed by the police department? So we will have a compatibility between the clubs and the neighborhood so they don't have a clash. Mm -hmm. um, Honestly, in the past uh, year and a half, we've had very few clubs come before the Commission for Permit uh, um, and Panel um, Review. Maybe they're operating illegally then. <laughs> then that's a, something that we definitely need to take a look at. There's a number of them that mm -hmm. are uh, sprouting up all over the city of Los Angeles, in Hollywood, right. in the central area, in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, in fact, Hollywood LAPD has a detail each weekend mm -hmm that goes out specifically to make sure that there's proper activity and not uh, illegal activity or fights, mm -hmm. but there's a great number. Mr. Garcetti maybe knows how many there are in the Hollywood area, but if you're not receiving those permit requests and there's something well, we are through the we, we are receiving the permit request, and the permit request comes with uh, fairly detailed backgrounds on the people operating the, uh, operating the permits. What about the conditions, though, imposed upon for security purposes to make sure there's no clash between the clubs and the neighborhoods that many of them surround? Uh, that's probably something that we need to take a little closer look at because I know it's not in the detailed reports that's provided to us by the, by the police. Because I know what a lot of those are approved on routine, mm -hmm. but with the proliferation uh, of the clubs, and not mm -hmm. that they're bad, but if we don't put proper regulations mm -hmm. and proper controls, then we've got conflicts with the neighborhood and then the neighborhoods become upset. Right. Uh, the overflow of parking, the overflow of activity. Sunset Strip is a classic example with the activity there uh, and some of the problems associated with that that impact the residential community mm -hmm. that uh, joins Sunset Boulevard. So just 
if you can, in your reappointment, look into that arena. And you may want to check with the Hollywood uh, Vice section and look into the club detail that they have, specifically designed to do enforcement. You may want to ride with them to see some of the challenges that they uh, encounter on the weekends. All right, I certainly will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zine. Uh, if nobody else wishes to be heard, please prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Congratulations again. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. Um, and on number 12, if there's no objection, we'll send that forthwith, please. Um, and we have Mr. Smith, uh, with Mr. LeBange's permission, has uh, gotten 24, is that correct? Uh, we'll, without objection to take out of order. So if nobody has a problem with that, we'll take up item 24, Mr. Smith. Thank you. If I could have the uh, Department of Water Power uh, staff come forward. Item 24 is just a note and file, but it's a, it's a matter of importance that we get this information out on Channel 35. Last summer, the city of Los Angeles, particularly the San Fernando Valley, experienced extraordinary heat problems, which caused the failure of thousands of uh, transformers, the blackout of uh, hundreds of thousands of people for many days, while the Department of Water and Power scrambled around trying to get power back on. We stretched our resources very thin. Our people did extraordinary work, some people working 24 to 36 straight hours without a break to get people's power back on. But we found extraordinary shortages of transformers and materials uh, that we really weren't ready. We ex ex started to uh, open up, uh, tried to open up uh, senior citizen centers uh, at our uh, facilities for people to go as a place to, uh, for refuge uh, without power, particularly those uh, temperatures in Mr. Zine's district reached 118 degrees. Uh, people needed cooling centers, and yet when we went out to open these centers up, our rec and park staff didn't know they were supposed to do that. They didn't know who was going to be there, how they were going to maintain them. Uh, we really didn't have a plan. And so 24 asked that we bring back a plan. I wanted Water and Power here to report on the uh, things that they've done to preposition uh, materials and manpower to be ready for this year so we don't run into those extraordinary problems if we have one of those heat waves we had like we did last year, uh, particularly as we've experienced a very dry winter, we, ex we expect very hot temperatures, we expect fires, we expect uh, disasters, and we want to know what the Water and Power Department has done, particularly to be prepared this summer so that when these problems hit, um, that we are ready. So if you could briefly just give a summary of the, the steps you've taken to prepare the, the City of Los Angeles for what we may come this summer. Okay, first and foremost, I, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, provide the Council with an update on the uh, status of Mr. Deaton. Uh, he, he is in a uh, local hospital here in Los Angeles. Uh, my understanding from the family is that uh, the doctors uh, expect a full recovery. Uh, and we will be issuing uh, periodic updates as information uh, becomes available. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to respond to the question. Uh, over the past several months since the last heat storm, we've uh, taken a number of actions, uh, uh, several of them with respect to improving communications, and, and some of it relates to uh, the uh, shelters as well as the uh, cooling centers. Uh, we've installed new telephone trunk lines to increase our incoming call volume capability, the customer service uh, operation. We've established uh, expanded call-out lists. Uh, we've implemented a new procedure where our customer service reps will go to our electric trouble section in the event of an emergency so they can get immediate updates on what's going on in terms of outages in the field so that we can update our customers. Uh, we've uh, improved the process to ensure uh, that City Hall uh, and media receive timely uh, outage uh, information. Uh, in addition to that, we've worked also with uh, Rec and Parks and uh, EPD, Emergency Preparedness Department, to establish uh, protocols uh, so that uh, when it's necessary to have cooling centers uh, as well as shelters available on a 24-7 basis, that that ha happens uh, almost automatically and seamlessly. Um, in addition to that, uh, we replaced approximately uh, 3,000 uh, transformers uh, uh, over the last uh, 11 months or so. Uh, not only did we replace uh, ones that had failed, but those that we thought were marginal uh, at best uh, and even uh, beyond that uh, additional uh, transformers. Uh, we've pre uh, pre-positioned, we have approximately 3,000 transformers uh, in stock. We've uh, uh, pre 
position those transformers uh, throughout the city so that we can reduce our response times. And on that point, how many did we have last year? Ready. Uh, I would say that we had, uh, my recollection is about 1,000 uh, transformers last year. Uh, as you know, uh, you were there at the press conference earlier, and uh, uh, we had about 1,000 uh, just at that location, Satakoy, uh, in the Van Nuys area. Uh, it, those are some of the improvements that we've made here in the near term, and we think that we're much, much better prepared uh, than we uh, were last year, uh, and we've learned a lot. Uh, from uh, that uh, record-setting uh, heat uh, that we experienced in July. Thank you very much. I think it's important that people know this, that we're, we're really thinking about it. We're trying to resolve those issues that popped up last year. The department's done a great job. I, and again, your employees were magnificent last year, working incredible long, long hours, 36 hours, some of those people, without a break. So we appreciate that. But what we don't want to do is have to go through that again. And so I appreciate what you've done. I think it's good we get the information out. Two things. One, will the council offices be given the game plan so they know who to contact if they have questions after hours? Yes, we will make sure that uh, all council offices have contact uh, information in the event of uh, emergency. Okay. And one other thing people need to know is that when the power goes out, you can't go to the web page and get information, obviously, but telephones continue to work. They don't ring, but they do work. And so anyone during a blackout can pick up their phone, dial 311, and get through to our city hall operators who will connect them with water and power emergency boards. And the one easy number to remember is 311. Or what is the other number that you have for emergency uh, the, board? They can call 1-800-DIAL-DWP. Uh, dial DWP. So either of those work even when the power goes out, telephones continue to work, and also everybody's got a cell phone anyway. So anyway, thank you very much for the information. I appreciate what you've done to get us ready for this summer, and appreciate the information of Mr. Deaton, too. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Reyes is our next speaker. Thank you for all your hard work, and it's good to hear the good news from Mr. Dean, so I appreciate that very much. Thank you. The uh, directive in this motion also folds in Department of Recreation and Parks in terms of how we look at our preparedness. I have a concern with Elysian Park in that as you walk through it, and I think Councilman Garcetti has point this out as well, many of our water lines that are used for landscaping and watering and keeping the area from being too dry actually don't work. And I know that's a capital issue regarding our infrastructure. But what's the coordination between the city's department, the Pond Water and Power, when it comes to Recreation Park, and looking at these hot zones if we're preparing ourselves in case of an emergency? Can you respond to that? Well, uh, specifically, uh, I'm not uh, quite sure. It sounds like what- uh, Please what hold I, my time. Yes, what, what, uh, just to make sure it's clear in my mind what the question is. Uh, there are certain parks where the infrastructure, the piping or the irrigation system at the various parks uh, may not be sufficient or adequate to- uh, Or deteriorated, you just or don't Or deteriorated. Work. We do have a, uh, I, I can respond to that. Uh, we do have a program. Uh, we have some uh, grant funds from Prop 50 uh, where we're actually putting in smart irrigation systems. We're working closely uh, with recreations and, uh, recreation and parks as well as the Metropolitan Water District. In fact, we had a uh, press conference out at uh, Barns uh, Barnstall Park uh, yesterday uh, where we implemented that technology where we received grants and worked uh, collaboratively with uh, other city departments including the Bureau of Engineering. Uh, we have uh, plans, I can't remember the specifics, I'm going to say there's somewhere on the order of 15 to 17 parks that we plan to go in and retrofit and assist uh, with these smart irrigation systems and it also includes uh, 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 assisting with the piping as well as the sprinkler heads, uh, high uh, uh, efficiency sprinkler heads. And I appreciate that answer. Elysian Park, I know is one of the oldest parks and its piping system has just rotted out. I mean, it just doesn't work. And certain areas are very, very dry, especially near the homes uh, up on the opposite side of the entrance to the Dodger uh, Stadium. So it's in that pocket that I think we need to focus on and I must have follow up on that interplay. Another question I have is um, I had several transformers burn out last summer along Marmion Way and in certain parts of the Northeast. Uh, the feedback I was getting from the line staff when I was in a t shirt in Levi's and asking what was going on and the line folks didn't know who I was but they were just telling me well our department now is buying 
cheaper products because of budget cutbacks. Our equipment is not of high quality. It's not the same material as before. And now we have to replace these quicker because they're burning out quicker because of our um, inability to buy higher quality parts and material. Can you speak to that? Uh, go ahead. Uh, Andrew Martinez, Chief Operating Officer. The, uh, I'm not sure who you were speaking to, but it's uh, uh, we're talking about the transformers are up there. I understand that. It's a no, line staff that actually does the, the job. Yeah, the individuals that you spoke to were not well informed. I'm not sure what they told you. In, in essence, as a fact remains, we have changed our specifications to buy higher quality transformers. Can you speak to the microphone? Because it's hard to uh, hear. Yes, we, we have changed our specifications following last year's outage to make the transformers more reliable and actually pay more for transformers now to make sure that the heat rise of the transformers are increased. That is, that they operate at higher temperatures without faulting. And uh, so, uh, again, uh, we've made our requirements and our specifications stiffer, uh, which is going to cost a little bit more money, but in the long run, it's going to be a good investment for the city to do so. And uh, those transformers have begun to arrive now. Oh, so they're arriving now. So the ones that we were replacing last summer are not the same products as we as what you just purchased? We purchased the ones under the old contract that we had. The specifications have gone out, uh, and we reissue new specifications are for the upgraded transformers. Yeah. Uh, again, the issue is, is one of getting a margin of, of um, additional capacity on transformers so they can run longer and hotter for longer periods of times. But those transformers will be coming in, uh, and somehow we're ready to ride. So how relevant is it to understand the old transformers or those that are ending their life's use that are located in very dry brush areas. Uh, I have the hills in Lincoln Heights and Montecito Heights. I mean, again, is there a way to look at that or just by chance that we replace them when they go out? Or is there an actual plan to understand and analyze which of these products will be burning out because they're in the at the end of their life? Well, two things. One is the age of the transformers. We're keeping track of how old the transformers are, and secondly, how, how much they're loaded. If we find them overloaded, definitely they're going to be exchanged much quicker than the ones that are not overloaded. Uh, and the ones that are overloaded will be replaced with typically a higher rating, that is, one that carries more capacity. It, it does it's nothing to do with the type of transformers that we purchased before. It's just that we add more margin of uh, capacity on those transformers so they don't overheat as much. And, and so that's the determining factor is going to be the age of the system, the piece of equipment, and how much they're being used as being those two factors. Uh, uh, the crews are going out to make uh, inventories of the actual loading that is taking place. We know in certain some neighborhoods uh, the loading has increased for various reasons. Those are the ones that are being tagged now and identified uh, to, to go in there and replace them with much higher capacity. It would uh, ease my mind if I knew where this is occurring in my district, especially in the hillside areas, yeah, because we can. of the dry brush area, and, and that would allow us to inform our constituents in these neighborhoods of the vigilance and the proactivity that's being demonstrated uh, given the answer you provided. We've been doing that throughout the city, but we can provide you specifically with areas in your district that you may be interested in as to where the new transformers have gone in or will be going in. I appreciate it very much, yeah. especially in the dry brush area, because that's what people remember exploding as they uh, fell apart. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Labonge is our next speaker. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, members, this is real important. Mr. Smith, thank you uh, to get these questions out. We hope everything goes well this year, right, Mr. Romanski? Yes, sir. And we're planned to have everything go well. We have the people lined up. We need to hire more crews, though. I truly believe that as you, as you have people retire and the deficient number of trained personnel, and I want the relationships between you and trade tech enhanced so that good paying jobs could be made available to good dedicated students who uh, learn the crafts, that it's really much craft. I just want to thank you for putting the uh, I in DWP and in infrastructure. Let's put it real high there because it's all important. I want to ask Marvin Moon to stand up who's uh, done a lot of good. Give him a big hand right there, just got promoted. But he's the guy, council members, who helps moves. You, if you want your power to stay on this summer, folks, give them a better hand now. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Marvin. No, I say that because we don't realize how old we are. We're 100 years old, this city, as a modern city. Just go back to 1907. If it was 1907, Anna, we'd be talking about 
the uh, aqueduct and getting that vote passed in that very important step. In 1907, we'd be talking about East Lake Park, not Lincoln Park, and West Lake Park, not MacArthur Park. It was 1907, we'd be starting to lay out all this infrastructure. And now, 100 years later, uh, some of this is not original, but close to original. So it's so important to be prepared. Have a family plan, folks, because stuff happens. And I know there's great uh, people who've served this city well uh, in that department and continue to, but I just wanted to give a shout out to be prepared and also to focus on that uh, push of the infrastructure and push it to get more crews. Just like we need a more thousand more police officers, we need a certain number of more lines, uh, linesmen and others who do that very important technical work uh, for Los Angeles to bring the power to the people. And lastly, it's good to hear that Mr. Deaton is back in the United States and uh, uh, recovering. So we send our love out to one of the greatest of all employees, Ron Deaton. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Labonge. Uh, there's seen there's no other questions uh, before us or colleagues. Uh, if we can open the roll on this item, close the roll, tabulate the votes. Twelve ayes. Thank you very much. Please give our best to Mr. Deaton and that we're all thinking about him. Thank you. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you. Um, I wanted to take item 11 and call it special, and we've had folks who have been uh, very patiently here uh, all morning, and there's no speaker cards on this, and I, I don't anticipate um, uh, any other council members speaking, but I did want to call this out of order because um, this is an extraordinary project I wanted to bring to everybody's attention. This will be the largest project that I deal with probably in my six years in my council district. Um, uh, close to a thousand units of housing that will be right on Hollywood Boulevard. Claret Group representatives who are here who have worked very closely with the community and I know there's some community members who've, who are here and who have been here um, have worked to ensure that this is going to be one of the most dynamic, interesting, exciting projects anywhere in Los Angeles. And I wanted to address one thing that's been written about for transit-oriented development that people are worried um, that transit-oriented development people don't necessarily take transit more closer to where there are transit lines. That may be true until we reach a tipping point. But neighborhood focused development, which is what this is, ensures that people don't necessarily get out of their cars to go to and from work, but they have the opportunity when they run those errands or enjoy life in Los Angeles to be able to do that in their own neighborhood without getting back into their car. After all, we spend a half hour just in our commutes, but about an hour and a half in our cars overall during the day. This Claret design project, which worked closely with the Nederlander organization to take land on both sides of Hollywood Boulevard adjacent to the Pantages theaters, builds on the uh, uh, momentum that we have next door with the W Hotel project um, and ensures that we bring good neighborhood serving retail, um, housing, and voluntary without any subsidy. We've been able to add workforce and low income housing as a part of this. Let me repeat that, without any subsidy, I appreciate the work of the Claret Group to ensure that we have workforce housing at both moderate and low income levels to ensure that people who work in Hollywood and are part of that renaissance can stay in Hollywood. That improves traffic situation for all of us, reduces pollution for all of us, and allows somebody who moves in there in a short time uh, to use an MTA pass as Claret Group is going to give to new tenants for the first year, maybe a shared car, or just walk the neighborhood and see a great play at the Pantages, see a movie at the Arclight, go to the farmer's market on a Sunday, uh, walk up and down Hollywood Boulevard to get a good meal um, in a way that improves not only the quality of life for those tenants but for all of us here. Um, it has been a, a longer road, I know, than, than, than Claret Group had hoped, um, that I had hoped, but I think we've worked really well together to make this something that has open space, good design, affordable housing, transit oriented. It is one of the most forward looking developments we have here in Los Angeles. And I just personally wanted to thank uh, all of the team and the community who worked very hard to ensure uh, that this will uplift Hollywood. This project by itself will not solve our traffic woes in Los Angeles, but it will help contribute to the vision of a city in which traffic, open space, cultural life, and residential life can all intermingle with commerce in a way that improves it for each one of us. So thank you, and I urge your I vote. Um, this is one of those things that you'll see a little bit of a headline t tomorrow. It hasn't gotten as much attention as Grand Avenue or LA Live or the W Project in, in Hollywood, but make no mistake, this has that level of significance for this city and for all of us. So congratulations, and I urge your support today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to rise and and applaud Councilman Garcetti for his work, his team, and the development world for being able to have the patience and wherewithal to get to this point, but to 
give up on trans-oriented district would be a big mistake. I know there have been some writing about what this is doing for our area, for our city, and the anticipation and how this is being reviewed is as if this is going to change the dynamics of the city overnight. Well, folks, we've got here over the past 30, 40 years, when we look at the kinds of changes that are occurring, where you have in South Los Angeles, Cosmo Parks District, for the first time in 20 something years, market rate housing being built, how we move the change in the image of some of our neighborhoods so that quote unquote desirability factor goes up. It allows us to stimulate new relationships with our space, with our air rights, with our streets. And I think that's what transit oriented districts are doing is stimulating a change in how we perceive our own neighborhoods, our own city, and start asking the question and finding answers to where will people live. So the more we get creative and the more we're able to change and push that envelope, more opportunities we'll create. So congratulations. This is another case example of how we incrementally start readjusting our infrastructure to address the pressures of a growing city, the second largest city in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Reyes. Madam Clerk, uh, if you would open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the votes. 12 ayes. Thank you. The next item is uh, Mr. Garcetti. I think was that 29 you had next or 33? 29. Okay, next item is 29. And that was called special by Councilmember LaBonge, and there are cards on this item. Thank you very much. Yeah. And if uh, Avak could uh, get the center table. You want to, is there comments from the public? Sure, why don't you take the public comment first? Mr. Dowd. Thank you. Yeah, just want to make an appearance. Uh, on behalf of ZoomaDog, I want to thank Councilman Zine, first of all, for addressing that medical marijuana issue. And I want those people to know there is a federal advocacy group they can attack. This, they can this is to. regarding the Sister City program? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sister City program. I'm allowed one warning, see, so I might as well take it. I'm from one of the sister cities originally. I was born in Auckland, New Zealand, so I'm a fan of the sister city program. But I just want to know where the cap goes on, on this program. Are there caps in place? I mean, there's a million cities around the world. And uh, so that's why I'll be fascinated to hear the report, the progress. I know it's one of Tom LeBonge's favorite items, the sister cities. And there's a diverse range of ethnicities in this town and a lot of representations. But I just hope that, you know, there's a lot of other issues, Mr. LaBonge, that, you know, that we need, we're having trouble getting them funding for. So I just hope we're getting our value on the Sister City program. And uh, I'll be looking forward to hearing the report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaBonge. Uh, thank you very much, members. This is a long-awaited report, and I think it's only fitting uh, in the comments on the public speaker there. Uh, this is generated by funding, uh, not from the general fund, unless there's a specific item that we have asked for. And I think Avak could give us a report on that when he hits the center table. But uh, with us this morning is Norman Arakawa from the Nagoya Sister City, Jocelyn Hervé from Bordeaux, our sister city in Bordeaux, France, Rod Dixon, four-time Olympian uh, from New Zealand, our sister city of Auckland, and uh, Pamela Spears, Spires from Athens, Greece, and representing the Guangzhou sister city, Kathleen Whitman. Right now, we have a very quick PowerPoint here as that we could roll through as the various accomplishments. Uh, back uh, in 1956, uh, then President Eisenhower said, I want a people-to-people -people program. I want to bring people to people. Understanding the rebuilding of Europe and the rebuilding of Japan after the war was very important that cities got together. Thus, the Sister City program was born. And Los Angeles has over 25 sister cities. And as we look through here, you can see our various orders. Uh, all this will be on a website as we've improved this program right here. Our history as it goes on, it talks about all our relationships 
and in the uh, sister cities of Los Angeles is a registered 501c3, and all our sister cities are listed here uh, and throughout the program that is there. We even have a very special uh, sister city relationship this year with Berlin, which celebrates its 40th anniversary. Now, additionally, uh, members, uh, we have an opportunity each year, and uh, it started uh, three years ago with a sister city festival where we bring everyone together. Individual sister cities have their own festivals in their parks or at various locations throughout the city, but we have one grand festival that is all together. We also have funded uh, through a special program that CRA has in Hollywood, a float for the Hollywood Parade to give awareness to the Sister City uh, program, which has been very successful uh, in that effort there. Uh, I have uh, been involved with the Sister City program since my days with John Ferraro, but more involved uh, when uh, then Mayor uh, uh, Reardon asked me to assist his office in the Sister City program and uh, continue through uh, Mayor uh, Hahn, and now with Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa working with his office uh, on the Sister City program. These reports will be given to you, and I ask that each of you get a staff member who may be interested in our Sister City program. Not just these festivals, but we also have a business exchange, which is so important, where we get together at the University of Southern California at the Marshall School of Business for getting participants uh, to learn about the opportunity for business worldwide, which is so important. Additionally, we have in the last three years had three new sister cities of Lebanon and Beirut, of Yerevan in Armenia, and Ischia in Italy. Uh, as I said, there's over 25 sister cities throughout. I wanted to file this report so people become aware of it. They could contact my office if they have any interest in that. And I would like to ask Norman Arakawa, the dean of the sister city program, the very special member of the city's team at the Port of Los Angeles, for some brief remarks. Thank you very much, Councilman LaVange. Uh, I do represent the uh, city of Nagoya, the very first sister city of Los Angeles. Okay. So as the, uh, I guess, the oldest of all the sister cities, uh, I, I feel obligated to uh, help the other sister cities as they come along as well. And uh, we've made every effort to do that. And I think uh, under leadership of Councilman LaVange, we've really grown from our individual sister cities to kind of work together and help support the whole sister city program. And uh, I know with Nagoya, uh, many of the council members here have visited Nagoya. Uh, we are very proud of the relationships that we have cultivated with that city and we continue to uh, build that relationship and make it grow. <coughs> Thank you. Good. And uh, Ms. Horve from Bordeaux, France, has recently celebrated Bastille Day. First, I want to tell you how much I'm honored and thrilled to be here in front of you representing the new Los Angeles Bordeaux Sister City Committee. And I especially want to thank Tom Labanche for, his, for placing his trust in me and uh, appointing me as a new chair of the Bordeaux Committee. So our committee has already been very active this, uh, this year in March. Under the leadership of Tom Labange, we flew to France and we went to Bordeaux. We met the mayor, the deputy mayor, and the council members, the representatives of the Chamber of Commerce. We visited the city of Bordeaux by the tramway and visited the port of Bordeaux. After, we participated in a very powerful seminar held in Lyon, waging peace in our communities. All these events were very successful and very promising for the future. So for this coming year, the committee has, is working on many projects in, on different fronts as aeronautic, film industry, because Bordeaux is also a move, has also a movie industry. We renewable energy and the student exchange program. And also now, I am very pleased to announce that the mayor of Bordeaux, Alain Juppé, and the delegation will be in Los Angeles from September 25 to September 29. And his visit will strengthen the ties between our two communities, our two cities. And, um, I want to thank Los Angeles for being such a beautiful and a welcoming city. And uh, from the bottom of my heart, I want to 
to, I'm looking forward to working with you for a strong and powerful alliance with our two cities. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. I appreciate that. Rod Dixon, four-time Olympian, and he's got a great program uh, with the Auckland Sister City that uh, you'll be uh, pleased Mr. Wesson gets involved with our marathon program. Thank you, Tom. And uh, it certainly is a pleasure to be here uh, linking the two cities of Auckland and Los Angeles across the Pacific. And our program in New Zealand is uh, called a Kids Marathon, and this is encouraging young children to participate in running the distance of a marathon over 10 weeks. And it is hoped that we encourage other sister cities around the world of, of Los Angeles to participate in this program so that those children can come to Los Angeles and be welcomed by City Hall and uh, paraded at the uh, running of the uh, Los Angeles Marathon in March of each year. And this could bring together something like 50 children from around the sister cities to participate and to be welcomed here in City Hall. And perhaps even we could get the mayor to run with them for 5K. So thank you, Tom, and uh, the opportunity to present those ideas. Thank you. And representing uh, Jim Zafras, who's the chair, uh, Pamela Spires. Thank you for having us here. Uh, I first would like to thank Tom LaBange for all it's of his okay. support and so on. But, well, it's not OK. We have to say that. <laughs> we want to say that. Um, but I would be remiss to not acknowledge Young Ji Kim, who serves on Tom LaBange's staff as well, who is an outstanding member of our organization as well. As a member of the city of Athens, we came here um, and became part of the city, sister cities in 1984, and the best year to do so was that was the year of the Olympics. We carry on that torch as throughout the, the years that we've been part of the LA sister cities. Recently, we have really emerged and brought it up to a level of which we've raised awareness amongst the Greek community, which is exactly what each sister city's role is to do. We're very happy and we look forward to the days ahead. We're now ready to really emerge as a true nonprofit as what it's supposed to be and be an active member of the sister cities of LA ongoing and forever. Thank you. Good, and Catherine. Uh, from Guangzhou, represent Jeffrey Chung. Guangzhou, Sister City. Good afternoon. Oh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to come. Uh, I am the Vice President of the Los Angeles Guangzhou Sister City Association. Our President, Jeffrey Chung, sends his greetings and thanks to Tom for all of the support that he has given to our organization, including joining the LA Guangzhou Sister City for a 25th anniversary trip to China two years ago. The Los Angeles Guangzhou Sister City Association will celebrate its 27th anniversary this December. It was founded uh, under the auspices of a certainly great Angelino, Mrs. Carolyn Amundsen. And since her death, we have carried on with the work, which includes cultural activities. Uh, next week, there will be a modern dance group from the city of Guangzhou, which will perform here in Los Angeles. Next week, also 22 people represent representing the city government of Los Angeles, a uh, city government of Guangzhou will come for a training program at Mount St. Mary's College and UCLA's uh, public policy school. Those students will then go on to internships in different areas of city government. The Sister City Association of Guangzhou and Los Angeles also participated in making the arrangements for Mayor Villaraigosa's trip to China last year. So we also uh, enjoy all of the great uh, relationships that we have with the city and especially with Councilman LaBange and look forward to even another uh, run up to our 50th anniversary. Thank you very much. And finally, Avakitalia and the fine assisted legislative analyst who has orchestrated a great service to the city. Avak, could you report or brief anything uh, to the council members briefly on the uh, progress of the programs? I really have nothing to add, but I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Oh, that's a good CLA -er. But Avak, thank you. Uh, members, Avak's the point person to go to on any sister city program. We're here to help. I just wanted to give you this report. Also, we have a website. All our cities, you're seeing it up here on the screen here. Uh, give some information. I think it's important to reflect in the world uh, that we live in today. Yes, we should do our jobs here at home and work hard for the city of Los Angeles, but also the relationship that Los Angeles has from around the world is important, and an, an important vehicle is that of the Citrus City program. I thank you for the time. I thank these very dedicated citizens 
for their work and, uh, and their volunteerism in this. And I also thank my staff member, Young Ji Kim, and also Jeannie Haruska, who uh, helped, but Young Ji for her constant leadership on this program here. If there's any questions, uh, everybody's open to ask questions. Thank you. There's nobody else on the speaker queue, but very much appreciate the report. Thank you, Mr. There, Mr. Garcetti. Okay. With that, let's uh, go ahead and open the roll on this item. And, Mr. President, this would be just a note and file. Oh, just note and file. Right. Okay. Without objection, we'll note and file. And thank you, Mr. Labange, for your great work re representing the city. If there's no objection, colleagues, um, I'm taking item 20 out of order. It's one speaker who's been waiting, and then we'll go. go. Mr. Weiss, is there any objection to that? Sorry. Okay. We'll take item 20. Uh, Mr. Weiser. Mr. President, after item 20, we could also take up item 31. We we, we, uh, Mr. Weiss, we've already promised item 33. Okay. There's a little presentation on, then we'll go 31. Great, thank but you. Go ahead. Ms. Hahn? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, what, colleagues, what we have before us is a re is, uh, would like us to reject an appeal uh, of a project that uh, unanimously passed the South LA Area Planning Commission. Uh, this project uh, is in Watts, and it's for 14 uh, townhouse-style homes, which is actually less uh, dense than what the developer was entitled to develop by right here. Uh, what you'll hear today is um, uh, criticism of this project and asking us to, to appeal uh, the decision. Uh, but I will tell you, my staff and I have uh, met regularly with the community. Uh, we've met regularly. Uh, with, the, with the man who will be uh, objecting to this project. And there was a concern that this piece of land would be better used as sort of an open space, uh, maybe a pocket park. But, but at this time, you know, there's just no funds that are, are available to purchase this piece of property and make it into a park. Um, Rodney Shepard is the developer uh, of this project and has met with neighborhood councils, has met with the community. In fact, one of the... Um, uh, past presidents of the neighborhood council uh, commented that she can't remember when a developer spent that much time working with the community, hearing their needs. But nevertheless, uh, this, uh, this project, uh, we, we can hear today from uh, Antoine on how it's right across the street from his house and he would like to see it as an open space park area. And clearly Watts is underserved in terms of open space and park. But we're now working with the community to develop maybe some alternative locations where we could um, try to find some funds to build maybe some pocket parks so that we can uh, bring more open space resources to this community. But I, at this point, stand in, in favor of this project. I think it will greatly improve this area, and it will greatly um, increase the housing stock for home ownership. Uh, for uh, people in this community, which I think is something we all strive to do. So, but let's listen to the objection. Thank you. Um, we'll take a public speaker card as a reminder to colleagues. This is a fair uh, hearing matter, uh, which uh, requires everybody to be in, in their seats for this item. Please, uh, Ronald Antwine, or excuse me, Antwine, will be our, our uh, speaker on this. Good morning. Um, good morning, um, council members. My name is Ronald Antwine. And um, I just want to just start off by saying I'm going to thank Janice Hines for all the blatant lies she just told about me. I mean, I'm not opposing this project. I am not opposing this project. What I am opposing is the policies and the procedures and how this project was expedited. I've learned since I've been coming here about the 500-foot radius, the notifications, and so on and so forth. And that's the type of stuff that I'm fighting. I've told the developer, and many of us have told the developers, Janice Hines just sat right here and said that she met with us. In 2000, in May of 2005, I came into this specific chamber right here addressing the same project. Janice Hines got up, got the stack of papers that I brought here, and they took me upstairs to her, to her office on the fourth floor. And what they did is they called Union Pacific Railroad, who said that the developer did not own this piece of property. This developer has said that he's owned this piece of property for the past two years. I just met with Janice Hahn May the 7th, last month, for the first time since I came here in 2005. I sat with her and a few of her staff members and some residents from my community. May the 15th, we met with the developer, Rodney Shepherd, and Janice Hahn's staff member, Pastor Robert L. Masons from the second oldest black church in Los Angeles, Macedonia Baptist Church. He even said that Janice Hines disrespected us by not even coming to our community to address our concerns. 
May the 29th, Janice Hines met with us at Macedonia Baptist Hall, Baptist Church. She was met by 60 plus homeowners and residents of this impacted area. And not one person said that they was notified. We asked if anybody has received notification from Ms. Zalasar and the Zoning Commission to please stand or raise your hand. Not one person stood up. I stay right across the street from this proposed project. We have not been notified. There's a, a gas line that runs. I got, got five more seconds. Uh, go ahead, five more seconds, sure. There's a gas line that runs straight up under this property that we've seen rupture in the past. We can't even get an environmental impact study. And I, that's all I got to say. We, because Thank we you, in Mr. Watts, we don't get the same rights that everybody else get. Not Thank even the 75 day rule right. They went past my 75 days Thank on you, the Mr. appeal Antoine. process. Thank you. That closes our public comment on this item. Ms. Hahn? Again, I, I think Mr. Antoine brings up a, a valid point. Um, while it doesn't change the fact that I, I think this is a project that is, is going to be um, important uh, for the community, it does not change the point that sometimes uh, I have also heard from people that planning does not uh, do a good job of sending out the notices uh, within the within the radius that they're supposed to and a lot of people either don't recognize the notice or they don't see it or it's not sent to their homes so I would like for uh, maybe planning to uh, I don't know is planning here today on this project um, why don't you speak to this concern that um, the notices are 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 either haven't weren't sent out properly, are not written in a way that people recognize them as, as something that's really affecting their neighborhood or their community, um, and is there any uh, follow-up when, when notices are sent to see whether or not people have received the notices? Sure. Uh, Maya Zaitsevsky planning. Uh, track maps um, are required to send out a, a, no a hearing notice to people within a 500-foot radius. So this was a track map case. Um, we have confirmation from BTC, the company that is the one who distributes the hearing notices, and they did mail it out to the 500-foot radius map, and also the site was posted um, at the time of the public what hearing. What confirmation do you get? They do a, an affidavit, a posting affidavit, that they mailed it, and any... any um, that they, letter, they say they've mailed it. And any letters that come back that haven't been received, you know, if they go to the wrong address, they include those in the in the file. We get receipts of those. So the same company that sends them out is the one that provides the affidavit that they sent it out. Right. Has there ever been a thought that maybe uh, there ought to be another way to uh, have some accountability there, like a third party to decide whether or not to? Because what what how we hold them accountable? I mean. They, they mailed it out, and then they say they mailed it out. And the only way you'd get back letters saying it was a wrong address is if it was mailed out. If it was not mailed out, how would we ever know that? Yeah, I don't know if any, uh, what kind of considerations have gone into changing the way uh, the city, I think most of the city's mailings go out through BTC. I think the only other alternative at this point But you can be, see what I'm yeah. getting at. Obviously, it's the same company that mailed it out, and we're asking them to swear they mailed it out. Mm -hmm. That seems to be maybe a process that we could look at um, to be uh, have a little more accountability on whether or not people. And the only way we eventually hear whether or not people think they were noticed is obviously um, complaints once the project, you know, is well underway. Right, and we do get a lot of feedback from people when the hearing notice has gone out because a lot of people are confused because we, we Did have... we get notices on this one? I'm sorry? Did we get notices from... Did we get calls? Yeah, did we get calls on this one? Um, Mariana, if you can come up. This is Mariana Salazar, and she's the staff person who worked on it. Yes, ma'am, we did receive calls from the public. There is a note to the bottom of the notice if there are Spanish-speaking recipients of the notice that they call for more information. That was the case with this um, notice. So we got calls. About how many calls did we get? Approximately seven or so. And um, do you have the addresses of where those calls came from? Not with me here. And the context of that, the fact that the hearing notice did go to the 500-foot radius, I would um, assert that it is within that 500-foot radius. 
that the calls did come from the nearby calls came the project from site. The 500. Did we get any calls from uh, any of the streets that were directly adjacent to this property? Yes, we did. From neighbors across the street, for example, I recall interacting with the Spanish speaking resident who lives across the street from the subject On site. On what street? 113. Okay, uh, well, maybe you could provide that to my office um, sure. just so I can have uh, some assurances that, that people, but I really would like us to look into the idea of maybe having a third party verify whether or not uh, n proper notice was, was sent as opposed to the company that did the work. I, I think that makes for a little more accountability because I think all of us um, want to make sure that every every project uh, has as much transparency, has as much opportunity uh, for the community who's most impacted to be involved uh, in the process. I'll pass that information along. Thank you. But having said that, colleagues, um, I, I, I uh, would like your, uh, uh, your vote to reject this appeal for this project. Thank you, Ms. Hahn. Uh, Mr. Reyes? Yes, if I can ask the planning staff to, to meet at the center. First, I, when we chaired this, uh, as chairing this committee and we went through this project, uh, one of the salient factors that arose in the discussion is the participation of the neighborhood council and some of the folks that were there. And what I wanted to ask the, the staff is, do you have a list of organizations that were involved in the discussion as you're going through the commission and the various hearings, is there any way to point to the entities that were involved? Uh, Maya Zetsevsky planning. Uh, the neighborhood council gets notified of the uh, filing whenever uh, cases are filed with the planning department. Um, Mariana, did any of them attend the, I know they came to the Plum hearing. Were there any, anybody at the APC appeal hearing? Only representatives from the Neighborhood Council were present at the Plum hearing. There were other residents who are part of the Neighborhood Council who are speaking for themselves at the Deputy Advisory Agency hearing and the Area Planning Commission meeting. Okay, I, again, I ask this question because it speaks to the integrity of the process. And so in Plum, we do have typically a group of folks who's, who want it and a group of folks who don't. And that's usually when you have the type of organizing that occurs when there are folks who have the ability to organize and pay for folks to show up. So it's important that we document who comes to these hearings, uh, who they represent, so that we can ensure that there's integrity in the process and how we un unfold uh, the, the type of community participation that uh, speaks to the real impacts and the real issues and that folks who are being paid to be in a certain place. So I think that's, that's a, a critical piece that comes from this process. Um, the committee voted to support the position of the council uh, because we did have an array of speakers that did say they were from the surrounding area. And it is unfortunate that the gentleman who spoke against it uh, uh, feels the way he does in terms of because it's Watts, we're treating it a certain way. Uh, I really think the documentation will prove otherwise. And I know I go through uh, a very exhaustive uh, committee process. And I know I try the patience of my colleagues sometimes. But I think it's critical that we have these kinds of discussions as we go through, through the decision making and weighing the pros and cons of any project. So I appreciate your hard work. But perhaps we can make a note, and I'm not sure if there's something we speak to the director to uh, start understanding and identifying the entities that get involved as they go through the hearing, because I think that would help us in understanding the integrity of, of our decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Thank you. If we can open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Weiss, for your patience. And item number 33 was requested by Mr. Weiss out of order. Um, so without objection, Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. And I'd like to ask the folks um, who are here on the blood and marrow drives to come forward. Um, colleagues, we're going to have a uh, bone marrow drive and a blood drive here uh, in City Hall. 
tomorrow and Thursday. You guys can come forward and have a seat at the table, more comfortable. We have Cliff Newmark and Zenobia Jackson, who are here from the uh, Blood Drive, part of the Red Cross. Shelley Baker uh, on the Marrow Drive. And Lieutenant Brian Johnson from the LAPD, who's also with the PPL, has been very involved in Marrow issues. Um, people need to know that the city has a paid leave policy, not only for blood donation, but uh, for marrow donation. And uh, th there's, there's nothing more important that you can do than get yourself in that marrow registry. It's a lot easier now to get your data in there than it used to be. It's, almost, it's literally a swab these days. Um, and uh, I just wanted to give these folks a chance, because they need to go out and raise awareness around the whole region uh, to talk with us for a few moments about the status of the blood supply uh, in LA and what people here can do. So take it away. Good morning, Council President Garcetti and members of the Council. My name is Cliff Newmark. I'm the Director of Donor Recruitment for the Red Cross of Southern California. We're responsible for recruiting about 300,000 people to give blood every year. Thank you, Council Member Weiss, very much for all of your support for the Blood and Marrow Program. Um, you've been such a strong supporter. I also want to thank the Mayor and his staff for organizing the blood drives here at the Council. Um, further want to, furthermore, I want to thank a number of the Council members, um, including Council Member Wiesar, for his strong support of the blood program in Southern California. Right now, our need is especially urgent. Um, if you looked in our refrigerator yesterday, you'd see 70 units of O-negative blood sitting on the shelf. That's for all of Southern California. And uh, we, for all other blood types, we're looking at about 800 units in total for the desired blood types for LA, Orange, and San Diego counties. So right now, me medical folks who are undergoing medical procedures may have to wait, and frankly, we hope we're not gonna have to postpone surgeries. That's the situation we're in today. If there were a major disaster, terrorist threat, um, even something like the Glendale train derailment or a Santa Monica's farmer's market, we would have a very difficult time meeting patient needs. Um, it, it takes about two days to process and test blood. That's why we always have to have blood on hand. Um, we always have a blood shortage in Southern California, that's a fact, and it reach, reaches urgent, urgent proportions about this time every year. And that's because so few people give blood in Southern California. We actually have to import blood from throughout the country. So even if we're prepared in Southern California, if the other country, if parts of the country let us down, we're still gonna have a major shortage here, which is where we're at today. And there's only one way out of this, that's to collect more blood locally. And we actually, uh, although 1,000 pints were collected from the city of Los Angeles this past year, which is great, uh, we could really use some more support. Um, there's about 45,000 employees with the city of Los Angeles, and it would be great if we could organize a citywide program. Um, and I know we can do this with the leadership here. To solve our current urgent need, we have blood drives coming up here at City Hall tomorrow and the next day, and also at Parker Center. Um, please, uh, it would be great if you could roll up your sleeves and give the gift of life. Uh, it's in the media room from 9 to 3, also at Parker Center from 7.30 to 1.30. Just call 323-900-4421, 323-900-4421 to make your appointment or go to givelife.org. And if you can't make the drives uh, over the next couple days, you can just call 1-800-GIVE-LIFE, 1-800-GIVE-LIFE. Um, this, hopefully we can help solve this current crisis that we have right now, and we hope to begin establishing a citywide program so we don't have to come here every summer. Thank you very much, and now we'll hear from Shelley from Merrill. Hi, um, my name is Shelley Baker, and I'm with the National Marrow Donor Program, and I just wanted to thank you all, all the council members, for having us here today and allowing me to tell you a little bit about what we do at the National Marrow Donor Program. I also want to thank um, Council Member Weiss for all of your support for our program. Um, what we do is we work with patients that need life-saving marrow and stem cell transplants. Right now, there are about six million people on the National Registry. However, a patient's chance of finding a perfect match are only two out of ten. So this is where we really need your help here in Los Angeles. Uh, the registry needs to bring a lot more diversity to um, the registry and with a simple swab of your cheek you would be able to give someone a second chance at life and join the registry. Um, like Cliff said, we will be at Parker Center tomorrow. Um, we're very happy to be partnering with the Los Angeles Police Department in hosting um, a marrow drive. We have a young patient who is in remission right now, Patrick P Pedreja. Um, his father is a sheriff in Florida, and he's been driving across the country um, wanting to bring about 5,000 marrow donors to the registry. And he's at about 3,200 right now. So. I'm hoping that people can come out tomorrow, um, join the registry, I will be there, and we can tell you more about how you can give someone a second chance at life. So thank you. 
Thank you, <clears throat> Brian Johnson, Los Angeles Police Protective League. Uh, Councilman Weiss, again, thank you for inviting us and the entire council. As you know, with the police department and the LAPPL, along with the Merrill Donor Program, for probably the last decade or so, we've been uh, championing drives all over the state of California. Probably have registered in excess of five to 8,000 people under the registry. And it truly is, I think everybody knows here, that uh, it gives somebody a second chance on life. Uh, that we have experienced not only in the police department but the fire department as well as other city family members so again on behalf of the LA, LAPPL we just want to thank you for your leadership in continuing to allow city employees to uh, the time off to go ahead and get registered and potentially be a donor thank you thank, thank, thank you all for doing that and colleagues um, uh, be emails going out of course to yourselves and your staff and city staff and hopefully folks will avail themselves of this opportunity. Um, it is a lot easier now to get your, uh, your Marrow fingerprint into the Marrow database than it used to be. Um, it's just a swab and, um, and once you're in, you're in for life. So if you haven't done that yet, please do that uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Mr. Labange. Uh, before you leave the table, I just wanted to rise for the American Red Cross and the program here. And Mr. Weiss, thank you. The city has a great history, and a lot of great departments have always led the way. And I appreciate you being the banner carrier these last several years, Jack, because it's so important to look at this. It's a very important factor. And in listening to the report, I hope we can spread it out, at least ask our neighborhood councils and some of the other groups to get the various constituencies involved in this program. So. Madam Clerk, I ask you to send a copy of this report to the Department of Neighborhood Councils to be distributed to all neighborhood councils so they know about it. That's, um, that's a great, is my call? It's a great suggestion, Mr. Labonge, because um, there are, um, uh, there's, there's real pressing need amongst people of color uh, to get into the Marrow Registry. Uh, when I matched with someone, I matched with a with an Anglo person in Canada. Um, but uh, we are a city uh, that is predominantly of color, and yet we don't have enough people of color in that registry. And so we really have to do everything we can to get the word out um, uh, throughout the whole community in Los Angeles. So thank you for mentioning that. Friendly amendment to the neighborhood councils learn all about this as well. Jack, thank you for the leadership. Thank each and every one of you. Thank the Red Cross. I... Thank you, Mr. Labange. That'll be accepted as a friendly amendment without objection. So let's go ahead and open the roll. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. We do have one speaker card on this. My apologies. Mr. Uh, Dowd? Matt Dowd? See, he not here. Going once, Matt Dowd. Going twice. Three times. Okay. We will close public hearing on that. Go ahead and open the roll, please. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. Yes, Mr. Weezer? 31 out of order. That's okay, possible. is there any objection um, on item number 31? If not, okay, if there's no objection, we'll take 31 and recognize Mr. Wiesar. Thank you very much, Mr. President. This item, it's uh, to uh, establish an HBOZ zone in Garvanza. Garvanza has a long history of bringing this, for, this item forward, and we finally identified some funding to make this possible. We actually had identified funding previously, but it was swept uh, not too long ago to uh, to provide funding for the planning fee study for the planning department. Uh, we've heard this item before in Plum a couple of times here in council. Uh, council members, I just ask for your support on this item. It's going to help preserve a, a historic area of the city of Los Angeles that's long overdue, and there's tremendous pressure right now to, uh, to um, demolish a number of historical units. So hopefully we could, uh, I could count on your support on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wizar. With that, let's go ahead and open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That is approved. And for the record, Charles Fisher, Danny uh, Bobot, uh, Rosa Rivas, uh, Teresa Costa, uh, Steve Crouch, and Tomoko uh, Copon, excuse me if I mispronounced that, were here as well. I'd like to establish that for the council file. Uh, next item, please. Item six, call special for cards from the public. Okay. Item number six is now before us. Now we'll take public uh, comment on this, uh, starting out in the San Fernando Valley in Van Nuys uh, with Donna Pearman on item number six. After that, we'll come Hello, to Stephen Wallace here. Oh, yeah. 
Okay. Hello, Mr. Garcetti. It's good to see you. First of all, I need and thank you for having teleconference system and listening to people in Van Nuys. Soon Harbor City is a great system. It's running great. We need more teleconference in every meeting. My boss will be glad I'm talking on this one. Number six, she and many others do not want to see this pass. You're penalizing the responsible people who want to get rid of old furniture properly. Do you want them to just dump it off in alleyways, streets, school, grounds? Because people will because they don't want to get charged. I hear this will char charge them if you pick up big bulky items. In the meantime, our CRA made our city bankrupt. So it, it has to find new ways to bring in funds at usually the expense of our s poorest people, uh, never, never at the expense of our city council representatives. Uh, get the money from the CRA and we'll have plenty of money and you won't need these silly f uh, fees. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephen Wallace here in uh, Council Chambers. Stephen Wallace. No. And then after that will be uh, Joan Edwards. Hi there, my name is Steve Wallace. I live in Harvard Heights area, Council District 10, Council District 1. Uh, I do support this, the fees. Uh, frequently, we uh, sit active citizens in the community constantly are calling in for bulky item pickup throughout our area. Most of the bulky items come from the apartments in our area and uh, we were kind of shocked to hear that uh, the apartments were not paying uh, for the bulky item pickup which is so important in our part of the city. Um, we do support it, however we do not feel that the apartment owners should bear the responsibility of paying the fee. I think more equitably uh, the responsibility should be uh, uh, levied upon the tenants who live in the apartment buildings. Um, the owners do not receive benefit of the, uh, the, ben the benefit of the bulky item pickup. However, the tenants who dump the uh, sofas and the large bulky items do. So we would encourage you to uh, levy the fee on the tenants, not the apartment owners, but we do support the fee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Joan Edwards is our next speaker. Is Ms. Edwards here? If not, um, I have a, a card here that um, it does not have a name on it. It says, says multifamily residential complex multi items. It's from somebody who lives at 2100 Fair Park Avenue. If you'd like to come forward, if you just give us your name. Uh. I'm sorry, that was my first time doing this. So. That's okay, don't worry, no problem. And. What is if, your name, ma'am? My name is C.J. Burris. Okay. I live in the Eagle Rock section of Los Angeles. Thank you. Um, I am kind of for this. I understand that apartment renters must shoulder their burden of cleanup, but I have a question. Uh, whatever happened to security departments? Because I know I paid one. And, and if there's a bulky item left in my apartment, or if I pull it down the stairs and put it in front of the building, I'm never going to see that security deposit again. So I hate to say this, but I think the marketplace is kind of taking care of this one. Landlords, if there is a bulky item somewhere on their property, will kind of keep the security deposit. And if this law goes into effect, that's not going to change. I, I don't see it changing because the landlords will call 311 and say, hi, there's a sofa in front of my building, take it away. And they're going to turn to the tenant and say, hi, you left that sofa in front of the building and you're never seeing that security deposit again. I, I help pay my, my property owner's property tax. My fingerprints are on some of that money. I pay sales tax. And while I understand this is a good idea, they're going to pay like close to eight bucks. I'm going to pay like close to eight bucks. I've lived in my apartment for a long time and I've never left anything bulky out. So I'm worried that the very people that are going to be most affected by this, like college kids and people from other countries who don't understand the rules, are going to get hit with both security deposits and payments and nobody's really thought how to sort this out. Um, also, again, the point that it's a lot of money. Already, every June, I pay nine bucks to have inspectors that I still haven't seen, by the way. And now you guys want me to pay for collection guys that I'm probably never going to use. Please, some common sense here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate your cost, uh, testimony. And Roger uh, Prochaska is next. After that will be Jeff 
Good afternoon, and thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I think a healthy uh, community, one of the very important things is bulk storage pickup. But I think a bigger issue is uh, to have a healthy housing community, and I'm very concerned that this is yet another program where fees and costs and responsibilities are being passed to the housing providers without adequate uh, controls on the people who are really responsible for these items. Uh, I think owners of buildings are the ones that call for bulk pickup. The tenants put the pr property out on the curb and they move. They move on to a different area. It's the owner who has to call and call and call five, six, seven times for bulk pickup. And finally, bulk pickup comes. But the property, the, uh, the bulk items were not placed on the curb. So the owner again has to remove the items into the proper location so they can be picked up by bulk pickup. Well, the bulk pickup comes again. And guess what? There was a car parked in front of the items. So the owner now has to provide for an empty spot where bulk pickup can come pick these items up. Now it seems a little bit unfair after all of that to now charge the owner to have our community look like a decent place to live for all of us. And that's whose the responsibility falls to, it's the owners. The tenants don't call you guys. They don't call the bulk pickup people. It's the owners. I think a far more equitable thing would be to charge the tenants for these bulky items because Thank they're you, responsible for them. Thank Appreciate you very much. Uh, Jeff Pro. Hi, thank you very much for your time. Um, we're a fa small family business. We live in uh, um, number se uh, CD number seven, and uh, it's a, uh, a direct issue of like the broken windows policy you have, or you would talk about it, where the large bulky items do create not only a disgusting look, but the gangsters use that as a hideaway for weapons, drugs, to hide from the police department. It is disgusting and it definitely needs to be addressed. And I want you to know is you all have a golden opportunity here, a fantastic opportunity to fix this system in more than just one way. If there is a way, instead of going about the path that you are thinking about it, is possibly using it for like our recycled cans and plastics to you can take the furniture, five cents, 10 cents a pound, whatever it would be, I guarantee you that people would actually put it on the back of their pickup trucks and take it to a facility and recycle it and get cashed out. I mean, it would be a win situation for the lowest of the low. You know, you're all worried about people that have, you know, these, that are financially hardship. I've seen people go into garbage cans. It's disgusting and that is hard work. For what? Five, six bucks maybe if they're lucky to recycle? I mean, here's an opportunity you have to switch the tables and make it a win-win situation for our community, for the city, and for the people who you most want to help. Um, the problem you have right now is if you, if you look at the price for the San Fernando Valley of just the fuel consumption every day, it, I can't tell you right now, I have to Google search it, but uh, my senior lead officer said it was very close to a million dollars per day, just the gas, the fuel. I mean, there's. There's something that just doesn't quite add up here. There's got to be a better way than throwing more money at this situation. Um, the second thing is the reason why it doesn't work right now is when you call 311, they don't, we have uh, street cleaning. They don't do it on Friday. They do it on a Tuesday, so they can't come to remove that kind of stuff. It, it, is, it is a system that needs to be looked at a little bit harder, and please, I implore you thank all you. to look at it carefully and find a win-win situation you. for all of us. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Shirley uh, Pachaska is our last speaker. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for listening. We are a small uh, business apartment owners, and um, I do support the program of the bulky items. It is a very, very problem in the San Fernando Valley, and in Los Angeles, too. 
We have buildings in both places. And um, I would like to see the people also make some money by helping clean up the community rather than dumping it. So I do support that the people would take their own stuff and be paid for that. Like they do when you put a refrigerator or a stove or metal out, that's gone within an hour because the people get paid for that. You do the same thing with the bulky items, I guarantee you, you won't have a problem. It'll probably be the cleanest city you ever had. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I want to read into the record as well. Jim Clark from uh, the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles was here, um, and he wanted to be recorded um, in favor of this proposal, uh, though he had to leave. So with that, we'll close the public hearing. We are not uh, taking action Actually, today. Actually, Mr. President, the uh, hearing should be continued. Oh, I'm sorry. It's continued until the 31st. We're not taking action, though, on the vote today um, on this. So we thank you for your public comments and for your patience uh, awaiting this item as well. Next item, Mr. Clerk. Item 13, called special by Councilmember Gruel. Speaking of patient, Ms. Gruel has been very patient. Uh, recognize you on item number 13. Thank you all. Just remember that when I have an item later on. I let all this, but uh, no, I'm, I just wanted to highlight colleagues uh, for you. There's a item, this item b before you today asks that we uh, uh, have our CAO with the Office of Finance and the Chief Legislative Analyst look at um, the billing uh, that we have and the collections. Uh, when you look at and uh, uh, Controller Chick went and looked at uh, particularly um, GSD and found, excuse me, several departments, but found that we weren't necessarily coordinating all of our different uh, collection agencies. Some we have in-house, some we contract out, some uh, if they're less than a thousand dollars, we then um, write off. Uh, I think there were, I can't remember, tens of millions of dollars we, we wrote off recently of uh, particularly collection items that we were not able to receive. There are a, a number of agencies out there. We all know that timing is everything and to be able to quickly get out there. This audit found that the uh, many of the departments were not following uh, the policies and procedures that we have in the city of Los Angeles. So we are anxious to, to look at this report because this is tens of millions of dollars that can hire police officers, repave streets, whatever it may be, it's critically important. And so I wanted to highlight to you and those of you in the various parts, uh, your various departments that you monitor in your committees, uh, that uh, we begin to look at each of these departments and how they perform their collection uh, processes. It's everything from new technology that is needed to, uh, again, looking at contracts and looking at resources we can provide even to our city staff uh, to be able to have them be more effective. So I wanted to highlight this for each of you. Um, to, to see if we can create, again, a new system and a way in which to look at this. So we will be coming back to uh, budget and, and finance and looking at ways in which we can save money and costs to the city. So thank you, staff, for being here. It was really about highlighting uh, for the public as well that we're looking at uh, saving taxpayer dollars and making sure that those people who do owe us uh, for, whether it be services uh, provided, fees, et cetera, uh, that everyone is pay paying their way and that we're using the best resources available to us to do that. And I know we have also uh, not only CLACO and Office of Finance that are here today, um, and I know Office of Finance has really been trying to be creative, um, but not everything goes through the Office of Finance, and there may be a way in which we consolidate um, that effort. So I just wanted to highlight that today. I don't know if any of the departments would like to say anything uh, other than uh, get back to work, um, right, that smile on their faces. So thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you all for, for being here on this item today. And we look forward to an expeditious report back uh, that lets us uh, be able to, to make some policy changes that are going to help us uh, recoup some of these dollars. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you to staff. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gruel. And with that, Madam Clerk, if you'll please prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That is approved. We have a public speaker card on item 34. Is Mr. Dowd here? Mr. Dowd going once, twice. If not, we'll close the public hearing on 34. If we can please open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. Next order of business, Mr. Clerk. Council has motions for posting and referral. Those are posted and referred. Desk is clear. Any announcements, colleagues? Uh, we are, again, trying to uh, focus our announcements more on the business at hand. Um, we're going to work out a mechanism for community announcements at the beginning of the week that folks can record on channel 35. So any uh, procedural announcements, business announcements? Um, if not, can I ask everybody to please rise for our adjourning motions?
ask everybody in chambers to please rise as we adjourn in memory of those who have passed. Thank you. Um, I'd like to recognize Ms. Perry first. Oh, thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. President. And I'm standing here with Mr. Edward Fuentes and Estella Lopez, um, who is the Executive Director of Central City East Business Improvement District. And um, we wanted to stand here today to note the passing of uh, charismatic and unique individual uh, who uh, was the unofficial mayor of the Arts District and his name was Joel Bloom. And I know that many of you knew him. Uh, I had uh, the pleasure of knowing him for many, many years. And uh, I think that Mr. Huizar came to know him later uh, and may want to say a few words about him. But he was someone that you would never forget. I remember the first time I walked into Bloom's uh, general store and he was behind the counter. And it's a short walk between the door and the counter. And uh, he was uh, colorful in his language and bellowed. And uh, I, I remember being uh, sort of bowled over by the intensity of his personality. He had a great love and passion for the arts district. And while he sometimes appeared to be gruff or a curmudgeon, he was actually very loving and kind with a great devotion to the community. He was a fierce, fierce fighter. He brought light rail projects uh, to downtown neighborhoods. He fought for dash service. He was fierce about the promotion of affordable ho housing. And he uh, organized one of the most effective neighborhood watch projects in the city. And I enjoyed walking with him in small groups with his dogs. Uh, I know we had a fun time one night going to the nightclub for dogs over Skybark, Skybark uh, with, with Joel. Uh, he not only served the community, he, he served his country, and he was a, an Air Force uh, veteran, uh, the war in Vietnam. Um, he is an example of how one person can be this incredible force for change. Last Friday, he passed away in the morning, and uh, by 5 o'clock in the afternoon, afternoon, there was a spontaneous uh, celebration of his life in the street uh, in front of the store. Um, that grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, he was, uh, it's just hard to put into words what he meant to so many people. Uh, before he passed, I, I, I'm fortunate, I believe I was fortunate and blessed to be able to uh, show him uh, a mock-up of the sign that was put up in the intersection near a store called Joel Bloom Square. He was still alert and conscious and fully comprehended what had been done for him. And, and I understand from his son that he was deeply, deeply moved by that. Uh, more than that, the, the day that we visited, some of the nurses there also have other uh, connections to the district. And as we left, uh, they expressed a great deal of pride in knowing him and how much they enjoyed caring for him and what an honor it was to care for him. Apparently, he was so popular, he was in the top two of uh, patients at the Veterans Administration who received the most visits and telephone calls of anyone in the entire uh, building. There will be a memorial event for him uh, this coming Sunday at 3 p.m. And it will be at Joel Bloom Square at the corner of Traction and Third. And um, I believe Ed wants to say a few words. Thank you, thank you. Um, as uh, any other artist, you sort of created a collaboration, so this is actually a little bit uh, repeat, and then we'll try to edit as we go. But it ends up being a collaboration of information from uh, Jonathan Gerard, a citizen of LA, uh, myself, uh, Eric Richardson of Blog Downtown, um, Andrew Moyle, formerly of the Downtown News, and Fittingly, it was finally looked at and edited and written by Douglas Galloway, a former colleague of mine who wrote obituaries for Variety, since Bloom was an actor. Um, the headline, what now? Arts District loses a voice. Bloom, a legitimate actor, playwright, and longtime activist in the gentrification of downtown Los Angeles, whose achievements resulted in an L.A. City Council naming, a square named after him, died mid-morning on July 13th in Los Angeles following a seven-year battle with cancer. He was 59. 
Bloom, who owned and operated Bloom's General Store since 1994 in the Arts District of Los Angeles, was one of the forces responsible for bringing the Arts District much needed recognition. From his small store serving as a town hall and as one of the founding members of La Raba, numerous achievements include bringing the community a bus route, 30 street lights, 75 trees, and organizing one of the most successful neighborhood watch programs in the city, plus being active with the MTA, light rail transit system that led to the solidifying of the official naming of the area now known as the Arts District. On July 3rd, the Los Angeles City Council honored Bloom by officially approving the motion to rename Third Interaction in downtown Los Angeles, Joe Bloom Square. And in a resolution in these very chambers, the lifelong White Sox fan and former member of the Second City Improv Group, former bartender of Al's Bar, was saluted as someone who raised the term grumpiness to an art form. During the early 1970s, Bloom served as a combat cameraman with the U.S. Air Force in South Vietnam. Following his discharge in 1974, Bloom finished his degree in psychology from the University of Illinois, and while searching for work with Chicago-based TV stations, he joined the Second City Theater Troupe as a stage manager. He later worked with the Organic Theater Company and toured with a 1985-86 production of Glengarry Glen Ross. Arriving in Los Angeles with a bevy of Chicago theater types, including former roommate George Went, he settled in the eastern industrial edge of Los Angeles in 1986. Credits include being a stage manager for Shakespeare Festival LA and later working on his own creative projects in 1987, where Bloom wrote a spoof of driving movies that was staged in the same downtown parking lot surrounding him. Bloom also led the fight to keep the LAUSD from using a building as a distribution warehouse, and that in 2000 became the home for the Southern California Institute for Architecture. In December of that same year, Bloom's doctors discovered a tumor, and several weeks later, he underwent 10 hours of surgery at UCLA. Bloom read a veteran newsletter mailed to him, which was discussed a connection between Agent Orange, the defoilant used to clear swaths of Vietnamese jungle in soft tissue sarcoma. The connection ultimately made it possible for Bloom to receive military disability from the U.S. government. Stepping off script for a moment and reading this this afternoon and this morning while waiting, I think that I, as an Arts District resident, can also see in Joel's character how maybe in Southeast Asia, seeing villages destroyed, work for the rest of his life to see one maintained. And in the last couple of years of his life, saw that it would be taken care of after he left. Bloom is survived by his son, Randy Bloom, two grandchildren, Evan Six and Sam Two, a brother, Michael, and sister, Lynn. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. I'd like to recognize, um, on, on this one, or, or okay, Mr. Weiser. Uh Colleagues, I uh, got to know Joe Bloom when I was a law student, and I was uh, on the resident advisory committee for uh, the construction of the red line at that time was uh, strictly a subway to go from uh, downtown LA to the east side. And he sat on this committee and people would ask him where he lived and he would describe the streets and people would ask, well, do people even actually live there? And uh, we've come to know, as we got to know Joe Bloom even more, that when we'd go visit him at his store, and uh, that people actually lived there. But he was one of the first, uh, he was a pioneer that not only made that a home and established it as a home for himself, but many more who, who followed after him. And his stubbornness was mentioned, and he, he was uh, kind of a stubborn person at times. He felt it got his uh, mind made up and had an opinion made up, and, and he'd drive that. Uh, you could appreciate it if you were on the same side with him, but at the same time, you got to move out of his way uh, if you're on the opposite side. Uh, but I've, I came to respect Joel Bloom. Uh, I, I, didn't keep in touch with him for a long time, but got to know him again as a council member. And uh, he's just one of those people who, who really make a difference in other people's lives, someone you want to be around, and had a huge smile on his face that, that I think attracted a lot of people. And uh, as the illness that he had been battling for seven years went on, you would find the many people he had touched throughout his lives by people coming over to support him, to donate uh, for uh, his medical costs. And um, I remember as well then uh, that uh, when I became a council member, he came out to, to see me and uh, came in a suit, which I had never seen him in a suit. And uh, 
uh, joked with me how he uh, he hardly ever wears suits, but when he had met me as, when I was on the committee as a law student, on the resident advisory committee as a law student, that uh, he wanted to present himself to the new council member in his suit, and I thought that was a, a nice gesture. But he was just a beautiful human being, did a lot for this community. We often talk in this chamber about how one person can make a difference, and here's a, a person who was a pioneer in the arts district, brought resources to it, and now as we see all this redevelopment, all this excitement about town, uh, about downtown, he's one of the first people who are out there advocating that more people could certainly live in downtown, and uh, we will certainly miss him. Uh, Traction Avenue and Hewitt Avenue will never be the same without him, and I know Ms. Perry um, has, uh, has worked closely with him as well, and uh, I wanted to say that um, uh, we're certainly gonna miss uh, Mr. Bloom and his general store. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Labonge? Yeah, thank you, uh, Ms. Perry and uh, Mr. Weedsar, and I think it should be all members. And uh, I, everything that everyone said was so beautiful, because this is truly what Mr. Weedsar just said, one person makes a difference. This person truly made a difference in the community. I met him when I was working for Mayor Reardon's office. In fact, I had an exhibit at his gallery uh, in the 90s, and he was quite a fellow from Chicago. Uh, God rest his soul. Thank you very much. We'll put all members on that. <coughs> that his family will appreciate it. And uh, I have never seen somebody fight as long and as hard as he did to embrace his life. I'll never forget him. Thank you very much, Ms. Perry. I'd like to recognize Ms. Gruel now. Um, I just want to start off and thank everyone for their support in the last week after my mom passed away. It has uh, really given me strength. Um, the cards and all of you, particularly my colleagues, um, just been incredible. You're more than just my colleagues, you're my friend. And um, uh, as many of you know, my mom passed away on, on Friday, um, June, excuse me, July 6th, suddenly um, at the age of 75. Um, I told a lot of stories at the, at the services, um, which made everyone laugh, which was I think my mom would have liked. Um, and to tell you how many people have, have called who met her, from the people she met at Jack in the Box, to Mimi's Cafe, to um, her, uh, I called her her personal shopper at the uh, garage sales across the city of Los Angeles. Um, you know, my mom was, was pretty amazing. Um, and I get a lot of my strength from her. And, uh, you know, I, I said at the, the services that her favorite motto was that unless a person sets out to do more than she possibly can ever do, she will never do all that she can. And um, she set out to do that. She had much more to do. And she was born in, um, on, uh, sorry, uh, June 24th, um, and uh, she lived a very full life every day. And my son, the other night, was so sweet and, and kissed her picture to say goodnight to Grandma. And uh, last night was the first Monday my mom had not come to our house for dinner to be with my son. And uh, I, I just um, want you to know that she worked very hard, came from very poor beginnings, and everything that she was able to accomplish was because of her tenacity and her strength. And she used to say that um, we were not to describe her as assertive, we were supposed to describe her as aggressive um, and what she did. Uh, but uh, the stories we've heard from people about how she touched their lives was really incredible. Um, but I, I most of all want to say thank you to all of you because you have helped us get through this. And I know there will be tough days in the future um, and we'll count on you to be there. I say to my staff, they've already, they're, they're my mothers every single day and added to that. Um, but I. I just want to thank all of you for your support, kind support. It, it meant the world to me and to my entire family. Um, my mom survived by her sister, Sharon Hefner, and um, my, her brother-in-law, Wayman Hefner, uh, my brother, Weston, um, and his wife, Connie, um, and her, my husband, Dean, and our, her three grandchildren, which were the love of her life, um, Samantha and Parker Gruel and Thomas Schramm. Um, and I know you will see in them the things uh, that she strived for and her influence on their life and on mine. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gruel. We love you very much. And we are all very blessed to have known her. Are there any motions, Ms. Perry? Um, 
Thank you very much again, Mr. President. And Wendy, I just want to say I remember meeting your mother at your bridal shower, and uh, she was probably one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. And when you told the story about your mom parking her red Thunderbird on your lawn, all I could do was smile. Yes. Um, just two quick ones, Mr. President. Uh, I'm a journey in memory of Margie Lee Thomas, who's the grandmother of Leroy Williams, who was a council aide for Council District 9. And she passed away July the 1st uh, due to kidney failure. She was a loving woman, and she worked as a teacher's aide for Los Angeles Unified School District and for the Compton Unified School District. Her love for children was apparent. She was a team mom for the LA Demos Pop Warner football team. Now here's the astonishing fact. She has nine grandchildren. This is astonishing. 54 grandchildren and 38 great-grandchildren. And when you say this, she will be missed but never forgotten because there are enough people in her immediate family to always remember her. That's astonishing. May she rest in peace. And then this is on behalf of Mr. Parks for Teresa Marie Hayes, who passed away Monday, July 9th at San Antonio Hospital after a long battle with cancer. She was born on February 13, 1939, and she was the fifth of nine children. She uh, was united in marriage to Mr. James Hayes on April 10, 1960, and from this union, a child was born, Brett Hayes. She then moved to Los Angeles in 1961, where she remained with her husband for 46 years until they recently relocated to Rancho Cucamonga. She served uh, 32 years for Thomas Brothers and retired and became a full-time community activist. She uh, worked tirelessly to improve the conditions of her community, and she was last employed as a field representative for State Assemblywoman Karen Bass. Um, she founded several community organizations, Wilton Gramercy Place Neighborhood Block Club, Southwest Empowerment Congress, Agenda, Community Coalition, Law PAC, and was appointed as a delegate to the Democratic Party for the 48th uh, assembly district and she was also a member of true zion missionary baptist church in los angeles she survived by her husband james son brett daughter-in-law paula and grandchildren jaden and camden hayes three three brothers two sisters relatives and friends the funeral was held today at 10 a.m at bethel ame and condolences to her family i think if some of you have ever seen karen or uh, assemblywoman bass out you probably saw her right there with her so, God Thank bless her. You. Thank you. Ms. Hahn? Yeah. Oh, you want to say on that one? Uh, Mr. Wesson will add as a seconder on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Hahn? Thank you. Uh, tragically, um, I, I want us to adjourn today in the memory of Maria Amelia, who, along with her husband, J.D., and both of her children, Jerome and Bernadette, um, who were killed tragically uh, in a car accident on Saturday on their way to Lake Tahoe for a family vacation. Maria Amelia was the kindergarten teacher at 186th Street School uh, in the Harbor Gateway, which is the school that uh, we've been holding our regular community meetings at since Shell Green was was killed uh, tragically in the Gateway uh, in December. So we've gotten very close to the school, to the teachers, to the principal there. So it was the principal that called me and uh, told me of this uh, tragedy. Um, her, uh, she was the kindergarten teacher. Uh, her husband was a dietitian at a retirement home. Their daughter, Bernadette, was only 23 uh, and was taking classes at El Camino. And their 15-year-old son, Jerome, was a student at South High School in Torrance. So it's quite, quite the tragedy. Uh, and I know uh, the kids at 186th Street School uh, are, are very sad today. Thank you. Mr. Zine. Thank you, Mr. President. I have two. First is Carolyn Ruth Haber, passed away July 13th. Carolyn Ruth Goldberg Haber, born August 16th, 1930 in Chicago. Beautiful and young, piloted a biplane in the early 50s and worked as a model before marrying future architect and movie production designer David in Cincinnati, Ohio. They moved to California in 1959, filled their home with four children. Carolyn's creative spirit and energy led her to many jobs and hobbies, such as singing and dancing in local theater, arts and crafts, and film production. But her greatest pride was raising her four children. Carolyn was a great mother, sister, grandmother, and aunt. She would be dearly missed by all her family and friends. 
She preceded in death by her husband, 52 years, David Marcus Haber, survived by her children, Robert, Mark, Jill, Dina, brother George, nieces, Marianne, Kathleen, Susie, and great nephew Bill, Carolyn, Ruth Haber, who I knew her family very, very well. May she rest in peace. And the other journey motion is for Howard Summers, passed away July 15th. Howard Summers was born June 2nd, 1932 in Los Angeles. He owned and operated Howard Summers Towing since 1959. He was a true pioneer in the towing industry, member of the official Police Garage Association of Los Angeles, as well as one of the originating founding members of the California Tow Truck Association. Among Howard's major joys was anything athletic. He ran numerous marathons, bicycle races, loved weightlifting, and participated in physical activity each and every day belonged to the same health club for many, many years. He loved telling stories about the good times he had with his dear friends who, made, who he worked out with. These people and the guys at his Tuesday Night Boys Club meant everything to Howard. A, a greater group of friends could not be found anywhere. He loved to travel and cruise. His favorite was cruising. He loved the great food on board the ships and the interesting ports of call. He could be seen on deck running every morning, still getting in his daily workout. Truly a remarkable person. Kindness, compassion, integrity, and humor. Considered himself very lucky indeed to have so many close friends and loving friends. Throughout his illness, their caring words and offers of assistance were a comfort to Howard and his family, dearly missed by his family and friends, survived by his mother, Molly, children, Robert, Gretchen, and Randy, grandchildren, Michael, Eleanor, Philip, and Evan, great-granddaughter, Longtime companion and wife, Deborah Summers, who loved him and devoted herself to him during his illness, preceded in death by his father, Oscar, his sister, Francis, brother, Jerry, and his first love and wife, Eleanor. May Howard Summers uh, rest in peace. I knew him also very, very well. He was always there for the community for anything they needed. And we know the OPGs do a lot for the city of Los Angeles. And he was a part of that community for many, many years. Howard Summers, rest in peace. Thank you. And a lot, Mr. Smith, as a seconder to that as well. Uh, finally, colleagues, ask we adjourn um, in memory of Eric Tang. Eric Joseph uh, Ponbung Tang was born in Katy, Texas on January 16, 1982. He's the son of transplanted Californians and UCLA alumni, also the grandson of refugees from Nazi Germany and Communist China. Uh, interesting heritage for a Texas boy. Some of you may have known him from his work from the Clean Money Campaign. He was, uh, he worked for many years in the California Clean Money Campaign where I came to knew, know him. Um, but before that, he had been a great, well-rounded student, a great soccer player, um, won a number of awards, and then came to UCLA um, in 2000. Became active with a number of student organizations, including CalPERG, uh, worked for Adam Schiff uh, in, as a summer intern. And uh, during his senior year, he spent a semester at sea, and in his own words, it changed his life. It said, it circumnavigated this amazing earth, quite literally broadening, broadening my horizons and it shaped his vision of, of the future that he wanted to live. He went to Zambia working with an NGO and built up the world's largest community library based in a refugee camp. Um, and he uh, came back and worked for the California Clean Money Campaign for several years. He decided to take a year um, a little while ago to travel through Latin America. He wanted to become fluent in Spanish, learn about organic farming and other eco-friendly disciplines, contribute his services to communities in need, and discover the world's spiciest, hottest, and tastiest salsa, all while living on under $10 a day. And unfortunately, on that trip on June 19th, um, in a beautiful waterfall, uh, Misol Ha, which is just outside of Palenque in Chiapas, Mexico, he died from a fall. He survived by his parents, Barbara and Sonny Tang. May he rest in peace. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. We'll next be in session tomorrow. That is Wednesday, July 18th, 2007, here in City Council Chambers. Um, we look forward to seeing everybody there. Have a good afternoon, and we'll see you tomorrow. This meeting is adjourned.